Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Sarah Brosh. Sarah is a PhD candidate at Yale and she was involved in, it was a hoax, um, I think people called it sleeping while black or napping while black, it was a viral video went out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to let her explain everything. Hi Sarah, thanks for coming on and thanks for telling us about what happened to you. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. It means a lot to me. Yeah, so, okay, I, the only reason I know about you is because there was a video that went out, or I can't mm -hmm. remember if it was a video or a story, and, I mean, you were labeled a racist and, you know, the whole other, like everything else, you know, I'm sure Nazi was in there at one point or other. Um, and the whole thing turned out to be a complete and utter hoax. So mm -hmm. if you want to walk through what happened and then, I mean, give like, however you want to go through it, like, you know, what had happened and the actual story or, you know, like, like how it played out, like, yeah. however you want to do it. Yeah. I mean, I'll just, I'll just start telling you what happened and, um, and then, you know, just, just bust in whenever, mm -hmm. whenever you have a question or if you want to redirect it all. So, um, so basically, yes, I am a, I'm still a PhD candidate at Yale. I'm finishing my dissertation off site and I was involved in, um, in May 2018, the the actual sort of conflagration happened on May 8th, 2018, and it became known as one of the living while black incidents, and it got referred to as sleeping while black or napping while black. And there was a video that was taken of me um, by Lolata Siambola, the the woman involved who who then, you know, went out of her way to propagate this video around the world. Um, and then, uh, so what happened was, is that I am like, I'm trying to figure, decide where to start. It is, this is one of the issues I've had with getting the truth out there about the fact that this actually was an actual hate crime hoax is because it is such a convoluted story. Like it is so, it is so involved and there are so many layers. And, you know, one of my biggest supporters on Twitter, whom I know you know, Gretchen Mullen, who goes by Skeptic Review 89, she always tells me this too. She always encourages me to sit down and do like a really concise timeline because it is the craziest, wildest story. She calls it a, a wild ride. Um, and I just love Gretchen to death. She's been one of my biggest supporters. But I think I'll start. So one of the biggest misconceptions is that people think that the living or napping while black incident took place over a couple of hours in the early morning of May 8th, 2018. And that's actually completely incorrect. Um, it actually was a, an actual hate crime hoax that took place over months. It took place over months. And the Yale administration and the Yale police were involved from the very beginning and they were complicit in the hate crime hoax. And they knew the entire time that I was completely innocent. So the beginning of what I refer to as the living or napping while black hate crime hoax, that really began on February 24th, 2018. Okay, so what happened on February 24th, that is when I came to the attention of the two main um, tormentors, the main instigators of the hate crime hoax, uh, Lolata Siambola and um, Jean-Louis Renison. I'm actually not sure if the man refers to himself as Jean-Louis Renison, but I've sometimes in print seen his name Renison Jean-Louis, but I'll just, I'll probably just refer to them as Siambola and Renison. I believe those are their two um, surnames, correct surnames. But anyway, so on February 24th, 2018 and during the spring semester of 2018 I was living in graduate student housing on Yale's campus I was living in a dormitory called the Hall of Graduate Studies 
And I was actually living a little bit like, or not a little bit, a lot like Rapunzel. I always joke and say that I was living like Rapunzel. That's what I ask people to picture when, when I ask them to picture my living situation. So I was literally living at the top of a narrow tower in that was part of the Hall of Graduate Studies on Yale's campus and I was living in a in a probably the most isolated dorm room in the entire dormitory literally at the top of a tower my dorm room was the only dorm room on that floor there were only two rooms on that floor and the entire 12th floor of the tower of the hall of graduate studies consists of this narrow landing the elevator and then the two doors to the two rooms on either side of this narrow landing in front of the elevator that's it that's the entire 12th floor of the Tower of the Hall of Graduate Studies. And that's important um, because, and then the other room was referred to as the 12th floor common room, okay? And that's gonna, that's an is, a big issue that I'll spell out. Um, and the reason why that's an issue is that because, and the reason why I get so specific with the physical location is because the false narrative, of course, that was propagated around the world is that I was trolling the huge main floor common room of my dormitory where there's a cafe and there's couches and tables and chairs and people just hang out there and you know, and people probably do dap there for all I know. I mean, I wasn't frequenting it. But um, and so people have this idea the the false narrative that was propagated around the world was that I was trolling the main floor common room of my dormitory at 2 a.m. Look, you know, looking for random sleeping black people to call 911 on. That was the false narrative either either out of explicit or implicit racism. So that was the false narrative that was propagated around the world. And once I tell people the real story of what happened, I mean, I hope they realize, I think some people realize, I think a lot of people are just insistent upon closing off their minds to the truth and they don't want to even see or hear any evidence other than the false initial narrative I mean that uh, just uh, sorry to me to interrupt is yeah. like I'll from my end right like I, when I heard the story the first time like when it first came out I was like all right that's wrong um uh, it, it like it, again they the way you said they framed it that's exactly how they framed it right. so reading it in that way I'm like well you know she was in the wrong right but I'm not one of these people to go pile on or whatever like I'm like okay that was wrong and that was about it that was that was the extent of my thinking of it and then I started seeing like, like you mentioned, you all know, mentioned Gretchen, like I started seeing what she was writing about it and I started seeing more and more about it. And then I started getting the rest of this backstory. I'm like, okay, well then, then she wasn't in the wrong. And, you know, like as evidence came out, it's like, all right, there's a lot more to this than what came out in that first story. And Exactly right. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, no, not at all. Jump in whenever you want. It's completely fine. I'm just going to kind of just tell yeah. the story and you just jump in anytime. Don't mm. even worry about it. So, um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, so I just, I just really want people to understand the actual physical space that we're talking about. I think that's a really important element. Because what actually happened is that I was being sought out, deliberately sought out, um, you know, in my isolated dorm room, which the other point I want to make is that I rarely left my room. And, and this is something that has been made much of. But it is true that I'm someone who suffers from mental health disabilities. Um, this is something that was very well known to Yale Housing and to the Yale administration. And 
that the, my living arrangement, living in such an isolated dorm room by myself, where, and this is atypical, you know, I even, I had my own bathroom. It was like a little suite, you know, and, um, and it was just perfect for me. I actually loved my room. I loved living there. I was very happy there. But the reason why I was living in such a sort of isolated way like Rapunzel is because I was struggling with my mental health disabilities, including you know, severe post-traumatic stress disorder. And I really just needed my own space. And I actually rarely, rarely left my room. You know, I would leave my room. I was, during the spring semester of 2018, I was teaching. So I would leave my room to go teach. And I would leave my room just to meet with, you know, to go get something to eat actually. And then also just to meet with my advisors, um, you know, I wasn't taking any any specific classes that semester, but I was teaching. And so if I was meeting with students or holding office hours or meeting with my advisors or meeting with the law professor with whom I've been working on a project for years, that sort of thing. But that was it. Like, other than that, I was perfectly content just to stay in my room by myself. Um, so anyway, uh, so... So what happened on February 24th, 2018, well, the one other thing I want to mention before I go into what happened on that date, which sort of kicked off the entire nightmare for me, is that, so the only other room on this floor that I was living on at the top of this tower was a room that was a smaller room uh, that was called the 12th floor common room. And this is also something that I explained recently at the Connecticut um, Freedom of Information Act Commission hearing to the hearing officer, uh, because I'm trying desperately to get the Yale police body camera footage from May 8th, 2018, which I feel exonerates me or at least exposes the Yale administration and police as having told disgusting lies about me. Uh, but anyway, so what I had explained to the hearing officer at the commission hearing is that, yes, this room is referred to as the 12th floor common room, but that is truly a misnomer. It, it was a little used room that was probably during the almost two years that I lived in my dorm room. It was used maybe um, once a week on a Thursday, Friday or Saturday night for, you know, a fairly raucous party. And that was, that was it. That was the only thing that this room was ever used for. And during the entire time that I'd lived there, I'd also never complained to Yale housing about, um, about, you know, the, 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 these parties that took place in that space. Um, so the idea that I thought that that space, and I I never used that space either. And so the idea that was also propagated that I thought that was like my space and I was controlling it or trying to police it and, and specifically trying to police, you know, black and brown bodies from being able to use that space is just completely ludicrous. Um, the other thing that I like to make people aware of is that I, I believe, if memory serves correctly, that there were at least one or two instances where I called the non-emergency line again of the Yale campus police during the, the two, almost two years that I lived there and asked them when, you know, when one of the parties on a Thursday, Friday or Saturday night went, you know, particularly late into quiet hours and was particularly rowdy and disturbing um, and I was either trying to sleep or work on my dissertation or whatever I would call the non-emergency helpline of the Yale campus police and I would ask them oh you know could you could you come by and just you know tell them it you know it, you don't have to go home but you can't stay here you know just tell them yeah. to wrap things up and they were always happy to do that for me it was never a problem and I was never chastised for calling them and asking them to, you know, perform that that duty, that exercise of, of their duties, of their responsibilities. So that's another thing that, that that I'll explain more about why that's so important in a, in a second, too. But that's another important point. 
So just basically the reason why I get into the specifics of the physical location and what what these rooms actually were and how they were used and how the Yale campus police um, is used and, and on campus and what they see as being their responsibilities. And I get into all this because, and, and it's important because what actually happened is basically the antithesis, the exact opposite of the false, grossly false narrative that was, you know, propagated around the world. Um, you know, that ended up, you know, destroying my life and, and human rights career. But anyway, so so that takes us to February 24th, 2018, which is really when the Living or Napping While Black hate crime hoax actually kicked off, which shocks people. They don't realize that this was something, this was a nightmare that, that I w had been enduring for months before May 8th, 2018 happened. So on February 24th, 2018, um, I was just coming back to the dorm, coming back to my dorm room. And I, um, I, there's one elevator that goes up this tower that go including up to the 12th floor and you'd have to have a key a residence key to operate it and also there are Yale housing regulations in place which are you know disseminated to all of the residents and you know you're if you're a guest even if you're a guest of a resident uh, you are supposed to be accompanied by the resident at all times when you're inside the dorm and um, and you're not supposed to be, you know, by yourself ever. Um, so I just that's and that's going to be an important point, too. So I was coming back. I think I had just stepped out to grab something to eat and I was coming back and it was Saturday, February 24th, 2018. And I just want to say it was around 5 p.m. Now, because of my mental health disabilities and because I had had actually a pretty serious safety concern the year prior um, in my dorm room involving access to my dorm room on the 12th floor of that tower, I actually would go out of my way to take the elevator by myself. You know, I didn't, I wasn't sort of like, I wasn't like freaked out about it or anything. But if I saw like anyone or a group of people standing waiting for the elevator, especially if it was um, a gentleman or, you know, multiple gentlemen, I would just kind of like hang back and just like let them go up and then take the elevator myself the next trip. And this was just a personal safety precaution that was my preference to take the elevator by myself. Um, but anyway, so I was waiting for the elevator and um, I thought I was alone. I thought I was taking the elevator by myself. And then um, I entered the elevator and it's one of these sort of like old fashioned elevators where there's a heavy outer door and then there's a gate that you roll back, yeah. um, an interior gate. So I entered the elevator and I sort of actually put my hand out to catch the heavy outer door and I was expecting it to fall back on my hand and it didn't. So there was someone beside me or behind me who had caught the elevator and was entering the elevator behind me. So this made me a little uncomfortable, but I didn't um, I didn't initially, um, you know, want to overreact or, or step out of the elevator um, just because of that. So. You know, I didn't want to be rude, seem rude or impolite. So I entered the elevator and then uh, there, it was a man. It was a gentleman who entered behind me. And at first I just thought, you know what, uh, just to be on the safe side, I'm just going to let him use his elevator key, you know, instead of me using mine. So I waited for a moment and it sort of became clear to me that he was waiting for me to use mine. And I kind of did already expect right in that moment that um, he wasn't a resident and he didn't have his own key and he wasn't supposed to have followed me into the elevator. And I actually um, did think for a split second about just stepping out of the elevator. And now, of course, 
in retrospect, I wish that I had because <laughs> then this entire nightmare and the destruction of my life and academic and legal careers never would have happened. But I didn't. And I'll be perfectly honest. Part of the reason why I didn't step out of the el- just step out of the elevator is um, because he obviously I could see that it was um, a black gentleman and I didn't want him to think that I was stepping out of the elevator because, you know, I'm a white woman and he's a black man and I didn't want to ride up in the elevator with him. Like, I actually thought that, like, I don't want him to think that. And I am someone, and I, I think probably most people already know this if they're at all acquainted with my story, um, but I just want people to know that I am a lifelong human and civil rights activist. Um, I consider my PhD dissertation a human and civil rights project. I'm someone who considered myself, I mean, definitely considered myself a civil libertarian um, with really a deep commitment to civil libertarianism. And we'll, we can talk more about that in a second. But I also considered myself to be, I called myself a proud social justice warrior. I'm definitely someone who considered their views to be on the left. Um, you know, and I, I worked with the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School. I worked on the issues of implicit bias and police brutality. And I saw myself as someone who was deeply committed to social justice, but also saw myself as being a reformer and a reformer from inside the social justice movement because I see true social justice only being possible with, you know, a a deep commitment to civil libertarianism, basically. But I just want people to know that, that, um, you know, I basically have spent my entire life um, doing human and civil rights work around the world um, and, you know, use my JD to um, help uh, African immigrant women and, and children get visas in France without being discriminated against. Um, I would sit for days in municipal offices in Paris, you know, to with them while they were going through the visa application process. And I don't know if people know a lot of racists who do that sort of who do that sort of thing. Um, do, you mind, do you mind if I just ask a quick question here? Um, okay, so what? the. the Okay, when you say social justice, like I mean, the term is taking on such toxicity right now. That's right. When I hear that, I'm okay. It's like I like the way um, uh, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose are distinguishing it, like capital S, capital J, like for the movement right now, like. That's right. You know, and then you're the Martin Luther King ethic of social justice, right? Which is just an ethic of it, which is different. But again, I'm not in academia anymore. I've been out of school since the '90s. Um, but everything I hear and all the stuff I'm reading and like about these diversity courses, like taking stuff like that, would that have put that in your head that if I walk out now, I'm going to be racist? Because, I mean, if you want to feel safe or whatever, you're, if you're looking after your own safety, that should, right. be your, should be your primary thought, not am I going to look racist or not? I'm just wondering if like, you know, the, diver- the enforced diversity training, if there was that stuff or it was that kind of stuff like going through your head like were you having to like make those calculations a lot or was that part of it or well i think that i think that absolutely the fact that i was so enmeshed in you know in in that movement in the capital s capital j sense even though i saw myself as being you know a a reformer and saw myself as being a deeply committed civil libertarian because I was so enmeshed in that movement and because I was on a college campus, quite frankly, where, you know, there are a lot of, you know, social justice warriors in the pejorative sense of the term. And recently, as we well know, there'd been, you know, some some conflagrations on Yale's campus um, involving, Involving race, um, of course, I'm sure you're very well aware of what happened to the yeah. Christakis. Yeah, that was ludicrous. 
right? The renaming of, um, oh, why am I, I'm having a brain hiccup? The renaming of the... Yeah, they call um, them masters, right? They, 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 they stopped doing that. The renaming of, of the masters of the hall, of the houses, of the houses. Hmm. But um, I don't know why I'm having... Um, I'm having a brain hiccup right now. The name of the, of the, of the, of the long ago slave owner whose oh, St name Stillman College. Was it Stillman? Yeah, I, think it, I was pretty. I'm pretty sure it was Stillman. Was it Stillman? And they renamed it to Hopper. They renamed the the college to Hopper. So anyway, the point being that there'd been a number of you know there'd been protests. There'd been a number of of really. Um, really incendiary situations that had happened in recent years at Yale involving involving um, race. Um, so but so of course, I I that all of that, um, I mean, it was a split second decision. It was a split second decision not to step out of the elevator. But all of that, I thought to myself, you know what, I thought I'll just step out of the elevator problem solved. And then I thought, No, I don't want to do that. Because I don't want him to think I'm stepping outside of the elevator, out of the elevator because he's a black man. That definitely, that definitely was, a, a, I mean, it was a split second decision, but that definitely was a big part of the reason why I didn't step out. And now obviously, <laughs> yeah. now that my reputation and livelihood and career has been utterly decimated and I'll never be able to work again, uh, I wish I had. I really wish I had just stepped out of the elevator. Um, and I and I and I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem. And this is another thing we can talk more about this too, but this is something that a lot of people have mentioned is that is that the the sort of the the hypocrisy or the inconsistency of woke intersectional feminism and social justice warriors because, you know, me too the whole Me Too, you know, movement yeah. and ethos is all about women having being empowered to speak up when they feel uncomfortable and being able to act in their own best self-interest and stepping out of an elevator if you don't feel comfortable in an elevator. Yeah, right? I mean, it's a, but like it's just because I, I, I've been I've been focusing on this. Um, Okay, I got back to North America in 2014, and ever since I came back, I'm like, what the hell happened? Like, That's I, right. you know, like it just just went crazy. Like, I'd been gone for about 13 years. I'm like, this this has just gone nuts. And this stuff, like, you know, the the critical race theory and the intersectionality and all that, like, I've been reading for about 18 months now. And I mean, I I, I think I've warped my mind a little bit reading so much of it. And it's just like, I'm mean, like, how do you live like that? Like, I I don't understand how you can live thinking like that and trying to do those calculations all the time because you're feeling uncomfortable walk out and if that makes that other person feel uncomfortable well you know at one point or other you have to be a little selfish right and your comfort and your safety should come first and you, that kind of nonsense shouldn't have to go through people's heads that's right that's right so so i then you know went ahead and decided to stay in the elevator and i used my key to operate the elevator and then I hit the 12th floor, my floor, and then I asked um, this man, you know, what floor do you need? And then he said 12. And so I thought, well, that was really stupid, Sarah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I kept riding up the elevator and I decided it was a Saturday evening, early evening, but it was still a Saturday evening. And I decided, you know what? Don't panic. Hopefully someone's using the 12th floor common room um, for, you know, for some kind of party. And this, um, man will just walk into the common room when we get up to the 12th floor and that will be fine. And then I can just enter my own dorm room safely and it won't be an issue. So we got up to the 12th floor and we exited the elevator and the 12th floor common room door was shut. And it's very obvious when there's anyone in there, you can hear them. So there, there didn't seem to be anything happening in there. There didn't seem to be anyone in there. The door was shut. We're standing, the two of us, side by side on this narrow landing, which is the entirety of the 12th floor. 
And I just was not going to open my dorm room door in front of a stranger. And I think even if he had been a woman, I don't think I would have done this either. I just wasn't going to open my dorm room door right in front of a stranger. You know, you hear all of those, you know, you hear those horror stories, especially like in large apartment complexes and in hotels where, you know, women get followed up to their hotel room and the woman doesn't want to say anything because, you know, she doesn't want to be rude. Um, and, and then, you know, you hear those horror stories about women getting pushed into their hotel rooms and then, you know, the person who had followed them entering behind them. Um, and, and so I didn't, I just wasn't going to open my dorm room door in front of a stranger, especially not a strange, a strange man. So I decided to, um, walk down to the 11th floor landing. And then this is going to be a little, sound a little strange, um, but, and you have to imagine, it is true, all of the buildings on Yale's campus sort of look like you're at Hogwarts, and they have, like, these weird little, like, secret sideways stairwells and stuff. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's a very interesting place. Um, but anyway, so there, I walked down to the 11th floor, and from the 11th floor landing, I kind of just paused for a second, and I was sort of just thought, well, you know, I don't want to have a confrontation for with this man. And I was sort of hoping that if I just walked away and stayed away long enough, that the situation would just resolve itself, that he would just leave or the resident who, if there had been a resident who had invited him, that that resident would just come get him or someone would come and begin an event in the 12th floor common room. And I was just hoping that if I kind of pot, you know, walked away for a couple of minutes, that the situation would just resolve itself. And basically the only thing I wanted to do during this episode on February 24th, 2018 was just get into my dorm room safely. That's all I was trying to do was get into my dorm room safely. Um, so I walked down to the 11th floor landing and he didn't seem to be going anywhere. It sort of felt to me almost like, and maybe, maybe my, maybe my sensitivities were heightened, but it felt to me a little bit like he was almost waiting for me to open my door. And so I went down to the 11th floor landing and I walked into this side stairwell. So this weird little side stairwell, I I went in there and then I walked slowly up back up to the 12th floor and I was just kind of walking really slowly hoping that the man would just leave or someone would come get him. And then from that weird little side stairwell, I entered into the interior of the 12th floor common room. Now the 12th floor common room when I was inside of it was dark there was no one in there so there was no event happening there was nothing happening and you do need you also need a key you need a residence key to enter that 12th floor common room so i was inside and i was sort of there was no people but i was sort of listening by the door from the inside of the room and i was kind of trying to listen to see if the man had left and so then it sort of sounded very quiet and still to me. And I sort of had a sense. I was like, after a few minutes, I, I thought, oh, I think he left. I think he left. And I was so happy. So I opened the door and there was no one on the landing. And I was so happy. And I just kind of thought, phew, no problem. I'm just going to go into my dorm room now and everything will be fine. So um, I was walking across the landing and the man was still there. He was on the landing between the 11th and 12th floors and he called out to me. Now, he he called out to me and I can't, you know, to the best of my memory, he said something like, oh, where's the, where's the common room or where's the 12th floor common room or something like that. Um, and so now, again, for a split second, I thought about you know, not even responding. And I, he was, he was at enough of a distance from me that I could have just um, used my key to get into my dorm room and been safely inside of my dorm room with the door locked, you know, before he could get to me. And I did think for a split second about doing that and not, not even responding to him. And now of course, um, two years later, that's exactly what I wish I would have done. Uh, but again, I didn't want to be rude. 
I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to be impolite. So I did stop and I actually pointed to the 12th floor common room where I had just exited. And I said to him, I said, I said, oh, that's the um, 12th floor common room. But I said, but you have to be a resident and you have to have a key. And I said, there's no one in there. There's nothing going on. And then I said, um, I said, if you um, if you're not, you know, if you're not supposed to be here, then I have to ask you to leave. Um, and then he said to me, and this was the only other thing he said to me is he said, I'm a student. And I responded to him. I said, it I said, it doesn't matter if you're a student or not to, to use that room, to enter that room. You have to be a resident and you have to have a key. And I said, there's nothing going on in that room. There's no one in there. And then I did. And I think that this was the thing that upset him most at all. Most of all, I said to him, I said, I said, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, you're making me, you know, very nervous. And I have to ask you to leave now. And then after I said that, he he sort of scoffed at me and then he sort of like moved as if he was going to walk down the stairs. So then I entered my dorm room and I actually thought for a second about, you know, whether or not to call um, the Yale campus police. And I never, ever would have called 911 and I never called 911. And I'll just mention, too, that hear that this whole idea, which is something that's being pushed by the Yale administration and the Yale police now to defend themselves, um, particularly um, with respect to the procedure that's taking place at the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act Commission with my efforts to try to get the Yale campus police body camera footage from May 8th. And I actually also have a request in for um, a couple other requests. I'll talk about that in a second. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that this whole idea that the Yale campus police are like any municipal police department, that they're like the New Haven police department or the New York police department is just completely and utterly false. And it's basically just an outright lie. They're lying. They're lying when they're pushing this this false, you know, narrative. Um, the Yale campus police function like campus security, and they it's all over their website. It's all over their, you know, any all of their promotional materials. They've made videos and whatnot now that like you, you know, that they're your yes, they do carry guns. They are actual police officers and have never denied that, but. They very much function like campus security. You know, they always, you know, say like a million times and a million times during this months long nightmare, I was told you never do something wrong by calling them. It's always okay to call them. They always rather you call and then they can come check it out and make sure everything is okay. And I had called them multiple times over the years that I'd been at Yale for all kinds of reasons. And this idea that you shouldn't, you shouldn't call them or that you do something wrong by calling them unless you want like you know, real, like a SWAT team basically to show up with guns, you know, blaring is just, com it's just an outright lie. It's just an outright lie. That's, that's not the way they function. That's not the way anyone understands them as functioning on campus. Now, I know that recently attitudes about the Yale campus police have changed significantly given, um, I'm sure you're probably aware of the shooting of Stephanie Washington that took place in April 2019 that was off campus, but it involved a Yale campus police officer. And we can talk about that. Yeah. But anyway, but, but at that time, I'm also aware of what happened with Charles Blow's son, um, if, in case people aren't aware. Um, I can't remember the year that that took place. I wanted to say that it was a few years before. I want to say maybe it was even before my time at Yale. I could be wrong about that. But um, a few, however, several years ago, um, Charles Blow, he's a New York Times uh, columnist. His son was attending Yale. And there was um, apparently there was a situation where the Yale campus police officers were looking for someone 
Um, and I guess that they were actually looking for um, a young black man. And then I think that Charles Blow's son, um, forgive me because I don't, I don't know his first name, but I believe that Charles Blow's son was just exiting a Yale campus building and just, you know, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And um, the Yale campus police officers came upon him and apparently he matched the description of this person that they were looking for who had committed, allegedly committed whatever crime had happened. I can't remember what it was alleged to have been. But anyway, so I guess he did end up getting thrown down on the sidewalk by um, Yale campus police officers. So that did take place. And people were obviously extremely upset that that had happened. Um, of course, you know, of course, Charles Blow's son, a young black man, you know, hadn't done anything wrong. He just was, it was just a, it was, he was just in the, ended up walking out of the library or where, wherever he had been at the, at the exact wrong time. And it was a really, really, um, you know, upsetting thing that happened. And that was, that was really bad. And, and I acknowledge that, but, but even so, despite that occurrence having happened, you know, several years ago, several years prior, um, it is just completely a fallacy to think that the Yale campus police in the spring of 2018 were viewed as anything other than really, you know, campus security. That's basically, and people called them for any reason, all kinds of reasons. I called them to wrap up raucous parties that had gone too late and they didn't have any problem with that. And of course, I didn't call 911. I called their non-emergency helpline. So anyway, so I went in on February 24th, 2018, I went into my dorm room and I actually thought for a split second, should I call them? And you know what? I just decided to err on the side of caution and call them because just as they did always encourage me to do in that type of a situation it was a completely normal thing for me to do. Um, so the first thing I said when I called the non-emergency helpline of the Yale campus police is I said to them, you know, I don't know if I need your assistance or not, but I just thought I'd go ahead and give you a call. And then the officer who answered, it was a gentleman, he said, well, just tell me what happened. So I told him and then the officer, the gentleman who had answered the phone, he said, you know what, we'll just send someone by just in case, just to make sure everything's okay, and that officer will come and speak with you. And I said, great, no problem, thank you so much, and I hung up the phone. You know, little did I know that I had just, <laughs> you know, um, opened up Pandora's box, but um, anyway. So um, then sometime thereafter, a short time thereafter, it did seem that um, some kind of party or event was taking place in the 12th floor common room. And then um, I, what I thought was so strange, and no one still has cleared this up to, for me to this day, is that I never heard the, the Yale campus police officer or officers arrive on the 12th floor of the tower. I never heard them. And that was so strange to me because usually you can hear them, especially because they have their radios and their radios are really, the volume's turned up and they're really loud and they make lots of beeps and all that. So you can usually hear them very distinctly when they show up. So I never heard them arrive. And I still to this day don't know if they even came. And um, and apparently um, it was alleged um, in comments made by CM Bola and Renison later that they had met them downstairs on the ground floor. Um, so I'm not sure that they even came up the elevator, to be perfectly honest. So but at um, then a short time thereafter, I assumed that they must have come because um, what was happening was and I think it it. it it took place over at most an hour and it was um, two or three groups of what sounded like two or three persons each. Now what it sounded like was happening is it sounded like that the 12th floor common room was being used as sort of a gathering place. And then it sounded to me a little bit like people were meeting there and then they were leaving in small groups. Like they were meeting there to sort of like, 
you know, make arrangements or, you know, decide what they were going to go do. And then they were leaving to go somewhere else. That's sort of so- what it sounded like was happening. And it sort of sounded to me like as people were trickling out in these small groups, they were stopping by. They they had been told what happened between me and, and uh, I didn't know his name at the time, of course, but Renison the man whom I had um, had the, the, you know, not even a confrontation with, you know, but I'll just say a confrontation with in on the landing and that they had been told that I had called, you know, the Yale campus police and they were obviously very upset. So I think what was happening is that as people were trickling out of this, whatever kind of event it was, they were stopping by my dorm room door and they decided that they were going to make me aware loud and clear that they were very you know unhappy with me for having called the police so what they were doing is they were stopping by in front of my door and they were just screaming you know and yelling mocking comments and obscenities into my door um and saying things like oh are we making you nervous because you know because i had told renison that he was making me nervous and things like that so Initially, when the fir- when it's when it started happening, when the first group did this, I was really upset by it. It really upset me, and I didn't. I didn't. It did not occur to me at that time, which maybe it should have, and maybe this was stupid on my part. But at that time, it didn't occur to me that it was a race issue. It didn't occur to me at that time that it was a race issue. Um, maybe it. Maybe I should have suspected that, but I actually didn't. I just thought they were mad that I had um, had uh, called the police. Um, and so I. So what I did, I didn't want to call the police again because obviously that's what they were upset about. And so I decided um, to uh, write an email to my two. Uh, res- what they're called resident coordinators at Yale, but you know it's uh, or res- sometimes they're called resident assistants. But the two graduate students that are sort of there to be liaisons, um, you know, and sort of oversee the dorm and help out residents, and you know they're they're actually employees of Yale Housing. Um, and usually, what it, usually at most campuses, I think they get their housing for free for you know performing this this duty um so anyway so i sent an email to the two um, resident coordinators for the hall of graduate studies the yale dormitory and i waited and i obviously you know i was very upset and i was also you know very uncomfortable i did i felt i was scared i felt trapped in my room I did not open my door. I did not confront the people that were yelling things at me. And I do not, and or I did not have a peephole in my door. So I couldn't see them. I could just hear them. Um, And so I just sent this email and I just waited and I didn't do anything. I didn't yell anything back. I didn't do anything. Um, I just waited. And it wasn't until many hours later after 10 p.m. that I received an email back from the resident coordinators and they had copied the Yale housing managers on the email and the email I received back was very accusatory. Um, It was very insinuating and it basically just said, you know, that, uh, oh, you know, this suspicious character that you called the police on, in fact, he is a Yale student. And then it said, you know, that we expect you to come to this meeting next week. Uh, It was a prearranged meeting to discuss housing options for the subsequent year. But it said, we expect you to come to this meeting next week and explain your behavior, basically. That's what it said to me. Um, The email that I had sent to the two resident coordinators, um, you know, a few hours before that, was actually just said, um, explained what happened and just said, like, I think that the behavior of whoever is, you know, the student presumed students who are holding or attending this event, you know, screaming and yelling into my door is just completely unacceptable. I'm not going to apologize for, you know, 
for being concerned for my personal safety and calling the Yale campus police reasonably and reasonably so. And it just said that I just really think that, you know, that they shouldn't be allowed to use that room anymore. Um, and so, you know, um, I was upset, but the email, which I posted, I posted publicly, um, and, and I am happy to make available to anyone. Um, I'm, that's the other thing I'm doing is posting all of the documents and emails that I have. Um, but I'll talk more about that later. But anyway, so, um, you know, I was upset, but I, I think I was, you know, fairly professional in my email to the two resident coordinators. So, so the resident coordinators whom I now suspect were actually there and may even have been friends with Siambola and Renison. And now in retrospect, in retrospect, I, I think that they were part of the um, living or napping while black hate crime hoax. And they were part of this campaign to torment and terrorize me in my isolated dorm room for months. Um, but well, I'll talk more about that in a second. So anyway, the Yale housing managers had been copied on this very accusatory email that the resident coordinators had sent to me. And one of the Yale housing managers immediately intervened and her name is Beth Bishop. And she is someone whom I dealt with before, and she was someone who helped me arrange my living space, living in that isolated way. So, she, and she was well aware of my of my mental health disabilities, and you know why I was choosing to live in that kind of space. But anyway, so she intervened immediately, and she asked me to come in to speak with her on on Monday, which I did. So now on Monday, February twenty sixth, twenty eighteen, I met with two. Yale um, housing managers. I met with Beth Bishop, I think the senior one, and I also met with um, a Kate St. Marie. Now, they could not have been lovelier or nicer to me when I met them. Um, they basically told me, Sarah, you did absolutely nothing wrong. They said, don't give this another thought. Just go back to your dissertation. Don't worry about this. It's over. We'll take care of everything. They said, we'll deal with the other Yale students who were harassing you that night. Um, and they said that they were also very upset with the way that the, the housing coordinators or the resident coordinators, excuse me, had handled the situation. And they said that they would be reprimanded. And they said, not only had I done nothing wrong, they said I was the only person involved who had done nothing wrong. And also, um, I just want to point out that in this email that the resident coordinator coordinators had sent to me, they said that they had met with everyone. They met with um, the resident who, of Siambola. I didn't know her name at the time, of course, and hadn't seen her. Um, they met with... Um, Res Renison, they met with, they said they met with the police. So now I just want to remind people too, no one came to speak to me on that Saturday evening, February 24th, not the Yale campus police, not the resident coordinators, no one, no one. Like if they really thought there was a problem, why didn't the resident coordinator who was apparently right there talking to everybody but me just knock on my door? Why didn't they just knock on my door? It's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, okay. I mean, like, also, the, like, like, the RAs and things like that. I mean, I never lived on campus housing, but, you know, spent plenty of time in dorms. You might be in your 20s or whatever, but you're still youngish, you know, peer pressure, Look out for your friend. So Ziambola was the RA, and then that's her friend. Right. I mean, if the cops show up, okay, and, and that's natural. Like, if the cops show up and your friend's there and you don't think your friend's done anything wrong, you know, you're going to try to defend your friend to the cops, right? It's, but yeah. in a position like that, I don't know. Like, it's, like I said, I, I have some issue with the RA thing because, you know, I, again, this is just. Or probably kicked me out of a dorm one time when I was too drunk or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I have an issue. Like, because, I mean, the, it's easier for them to play favoritism. But again, I, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say that's what's happened, but I mean, it, it, it kind of seems like that at this point anyways. 
It does. At this point, it definitely seems like that to me. So anyway, so on February 26th, 2018, that Monday after I met with the Yale housing managers, I was perfectly content. I thought, it's over. It's done. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. And I certainly, I told the Yale housing managers, look, I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. I don't want anybody to be disciplined. I just I just want to be left alone and in peace to finish my dissertation. That's it. I just wanted to be left alone. I was perfectly happy to ha- to let the Yale housing managers handle it. I was perfectly happy for it just to be over. I didn't really I didn't think it was even that. I didn't think at that point that it was that big of a deal or anything to get that upset about. Um You know, I was upset about having been harassed, but I was happy just to let it go. I certainly just, I did not want to destroy anyone's life. That's what I told the Yale housing managers. I am not in the business of destroying anyone's life. You know, as long as I'm left alone, I'm perfectly content. So then um, towards the end of that week, on March 1st, Thursday, March 1st, 2018, I get an email from the one Yale housing manager, Kate St. Marie, and she says that I have to come in the next day to meet with the Yale housing director, George Longyear, and the two resident coordinators. Now, I don't, this is the last thing that I want to do on earth. It, it just sounds like pure hell to me because you know what I actually thought the meeting was going to be about. I thought it was a meeting so that the resident coordinators could apologize to me for their behavior and for the way they handled the situation. And I didn't care. And I, you know, and that just sounded like the absolute last thing I wanted to do on earth. So I just, so I tried to tell Kate St. Maria, I said, it's so unnecessary. I'm happy just to let it go. It's done for me. I just want to be left alone and in peace. It's over. And then she said, no, you really have to come in and meet with the Yale housing director tomorrow, George Longyear. So I go and meet on Friday, March 2nd, uh, 2018. I go in and I meet with Yale housing director, George Longyear. And then the one of the two resident coordinators is there, the man, the young man, not the woman. Um, I And I don't know why she wasn't there. Um, I suspect now in retrospect that she was, you know, very furious with me. But anyway, so um, I go in and then um, George Longyear proceeds to tell me, much to my shock, that I've been um, I've been accused of racism. And he tells me that Um, And this is something that he later denied and that Yale grad school diversity dean Michelle Niren later denied, but it's the absolute truth. So he, so George Longyear told me um, basically that this was something that was basically spreading like wildfire across Yale's campus. He tells me it's spreading like wildfire throughout the administration. And he tells me that it's, you know, becoming quite the conflagration. And he tells me that um, that a group of Yale deans has convened in some manner that um, he tells me that the, the man whom I had encountered and then the resident who had invited him, that they had written a letter to Yale grad school diversity dean Michelle Niren. Um, And that this is, he said, quote unquote, gaining traction. And so he told me that this group of Yale deans that had gotten riled up about this event had convened in some manner. And I don't know if that meant physically or just, you know, electronically, I'm not sure. But that he told me that they had convened in some manner and he didn't use the word punishment, but he basically said that they had basically determined, you know, what to do with me and how to punish me. Um, He actually used the words that they wanted to use this as a quote unquote, um, you know, learning opportunity and quote unquote teaching opportunity. This was a chance for me to learn how not to be such a, such an egregious racist. Go for re-education. Yes. (laughs) Re-education. I like to call it now. I call it that they wanted me to, um, uh, you know, participate in their Maoist struggle sessions. So he tells me that what they've decided I need to do is that I need to participate in a public town hall 
uh, and I need to profess my racism at this public town hall, and I need to teach other members of the Yale community how not to be racist like me. And then he also tells me that they want me to undergo implicit bias training. And he tells me that now they're going to, because of me, because of my gross racist actions, that they're going to, uh, that they're now going to implement as a policy that all incoming grad students will have to undergo implicit bias training. So, of course, my jaw drops to the floor. I'm in complete shock at what he's telling me. And I tell him, you know, that this is, you know, I didn't use the word crazy, but I just said, basically said, this is crazy. I, I'm a lifelong human and civil rights activist. I work with the Justice Collaboratory. I could probably run an implicit bias training session for you if you want me to. I don't need, I work on the issue of implicit bias with the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School. I don't need to undergo implicit bias. I work on the issue of police brutality. So, um, so I, I'm explaining this to him and I think once he realizes who I am and the work that I do and that this is obviously just a complete and utter mistake, that some huge mistake has been made here. Um, but I think he, he, he gets very nervous. George Longyear, Yale housing director, George Longyear, he gets very nervous and it's very obvious to me that he wants to get me out of his office as, and wash his hands of this entire thing very quickly. And um, he was like, well, and he basically, he obviously did not use these words, but this is what I gleaned from what he said. So he basically, he wants the whole meeting to end and me to get out ASAP. So he basically says to me, well, I just wanted to let you know uh, that this is becoming an issue, which I, basically I interpreted what he said as him saying, um, I just wanted to let you know that shit's about to hit the fan and now get out and I wash my hands of you, which is basically what happened. So he basically, he stands up, you know, the get out now, stand up. And I try to ask him, I try to ask him, but wait, the Yale housing managers told me that they were going to deal with the Yale students who actually harassed me on the evening of February 24th, 2018. And when I, now, when I said that, I don't know if this is true or not, because he has subsequently told lies. But uh, when I said that, Yale Housing Director George Longyear acted like he was shocked acted like he had never heard before that I was the person who was actually harassed on that Saturday evening. So he, he told me that he would look into it and he would find out what, if anything, had been done. And he basically then, like, started walking towards the door. Like, he just wanted me out of his office as soon as possible. So I left. And then what ended up happening over the next week or so is that at first I just took, I think I just took a day to kind of just try to process what was happening. And when I started realizing, I started realizing pretty quickly that I was in pretty serious trouble. I was in pretty serious trouble. Um, because what became clear to me in, in between March, Friday, March 2nd, 2018 and Friday, March 9th, 2018, during this week, I first tried to deal with Yale housing, including Director Longyear, the resident coordinators, the Yale housing managers. And I tried to kind of rectify the situation and clear up the situation with them. And I also was trying to, I started getting concerned because obviously these people who are obviously incredibly upset with me and have falsely accused me of racism know where I live. They know where I live. Mm -hmm. And um, actually the night before I met with Director Longyear on that Thursday evening, March 1st, which I subsequently realized was the beginning of that common room, that 12th floor common room being used to, to torment me, basically. This, like, you know, insane kind of raucous party had taken place. Um, and then 
So then during this week from March 2nd to March 9th, I was trying to get Yale housing just to close that common room or at least close it for the rest of the year or close it for, you know, parties at least, um, which is all that it had been used for. Um, and actually, when I had met with the Yale housing managers on that Monday, um, they had told me that if that common room was a problem, they would close it. They would just close it. It, he, she said to me, Beth Bishop said to me, if that common room is a problem, I will just close it. I'll just close it. I'll just make it in, inaccessible for everyone. It was only being used for, you know, a party once a week, basically. So anyway, so I realized, so um, I realized that that party that had been booked on that March 1st was just the beginning of the resident coordinators using that common room to torment me basically by just using it to you know book party after party after party late night you know crazy party and um you know i'm under no illusions that they were doing this on purpose and i describe that now as being the first phase of the harassment against me and there were three phases of harassment that took place between february 24th uh, and May 8th, 2018. So during this week, I'm trying to deal with Yale housing between March 2nd and March 9th. Now, at some point, um, Yale housing director just says that he's not going to deal with me anymore. And he and I ask for the letter to this letter that Siambola and Renison had written to um, Dean Niren, Yale Grad School Diversity Dean Niren. And um, or at least to know its contents or at least to know what it was that I was being accused of having said or done that was actually that was racist. No one will tell me. Um, so he so at some point during this week, um, Yale housing director George Longyear turns me over to Yale grad school dean diverse diversity dean Michelle Niren, And I start trying to deal with her. Um, and oh, so a, now. Sorry, just a quick question on this. Because I know they expanded a lot of the, like they they expanded the scope of it. So like, yeah. would that have fallen under Title IX or was that something different? Well, this is what I tried to do. This is one of the things I tried to do to. So this group of Yale deans, I describe it as basically formed a mob against me, and they decided that they were going to publicly brand me a racist mm -hmm. and try to destroy me. And now there's there's a very specific reason for that, which we can go into later. But basically what I did, one of the things that I did, and she is, Yale Grad School Diversity Dean Michelle Niren is the Title IX coordinator for the Yale Graduate School. One of the things that I tried to do to sort of resist their efforts to publicly brand, publicly and falsely brand me a racist and destroy my human and civil rights academic and legal careers um, was to pursue their actions under Title IX. And I, I, you know, I felt like Dean Niren became, you know, very hostile towards me pretty much immediately. Um, and she refused to meet with me um, if it was going to be recorded in any way. And I said, no, I, I said, I saw the writing on the wall right away. So I said, I don't, I don't, I'm not willing to meet with you. She wanted me just to come meet with her privately um, without it being recorded in any way. And I just said, no, I'm not willing to do that. I said, I said, honestly, at this point, I, because um, at that point, um, Director Longyear had already denied some of the things that he had said to me when we met on March 2nd. And so I felt very uncomfortable. I felt like I, w I already felt like I was being railroaded. I already felt like I was being harassed by the resident coordinators under the auspices of Yale Housing and the Yale administration. And I was really worried that my life would, that there was already a plan in place to destroy my life. So I saw the writing on the wall and I told um, graduate diversity dean, graduate school diversity dean Michelle Niren that I was not willing to meet with her and that I really, unless it was recorded, and I really wanted every, I really just wanted everything to be in writing at this point. And so she, she really responded poorly to that. Um, so anyway, so, so I, at this point, 
I'm I'm getting really I'm getting quite scared. I'm getting quite scared. And I decide that what I need to do is I really need to um, go to the Yale campus police and I need to file a police report just to document the truth, to document everything that had happened up until that point. So on March, Friday, March 9th, 2018, I went to the Yale campus police department and I filed a police report with um, Yale campus police officer, Grace Schenkel. And I've released that police report. You can read it. Um, it's largely correct. And she was she was very kind to me. I don't have an issue with her. And I there's a couple relatively minor errors in the police report. But I don't think that she had any malice in making those errors. I think it was just simple human error. But um, I've released that police report publicly. And also an, an additional FOIA request that I've made of the Yale campus police um, since then is that I've actually requested the video. She had bought her body cam video um, video recorder on during that interview when I went to interview with her on Friday, March 9th, 2018, and I've requested that video. And I think that that video will go a long way towards exonerating me and um, is a very important get. So anyway, so I have filed a police report documenting everything that had happened at that time. This is also the point at which I began, um, you know, stating that I was prepared to protect my rights and interests legally if necessary, and that I would take legal action if I felt that I needed to against the Yale administration. And I also made clear, oh, responding to your earlier question, I made clear at this point that I felt that in particular, um, Yale Graduate School Diversity Dean Michelle Nearon was in violation of Title IX. She was the one who was in violation of Title IX because I felt that Yale was basically saying that, you know, uh, a woman graduate student doesn't have the right to take simple and reasonable precautions to make sure that she can enter her own dorm room safely. Um, and that I basically felt like I was being punished for having done that, for having taken simple and reasonable precautions to make sure, to ensure my personal safety. And additionally, when I tried to address the fact that I was the person who had actually been harassed on the evening of um, February 24th, 2018 with grad school diversity dean Michelle Niren, um, and, and I, I believe that I have released this email publicly Oh, it's contents I absolutely have. And I certainly can release the actual PDF of the email publicly as well. I'm going to release everything publicly, the actual PDFs. But the contents of the email, I basically retyped it into my into a blog post. So this ha the contents have been released. Um, but I interpreted the way that um, Diversity Dean Michelle Niren responded to me as basically telling me that if I have concerns for my personal safety in my dorm room, uh, that I should move out, that I should move out. And she also made clear to me that she had no intention of addressing the presumed Yale students who actually harassed me on the evening of Saturday, February 24th, 2018. Um, so I was I was really upset and I felt that her behavior was an egregious violation of Title IX regulations. Um, so and uh, so I I did I did I went ahead and pursued that. So during um, one thing that I think people need to understand that's important is that March 9th, Friday, March 9th was the last day of classes. It was the beginning of spring break, spring break. And spring break in 2018 was the next two weeks. So for the next two weeks until March 26th, 2018, there were almost no students on campus and it was spring break. And that's important to know. So now also on March 9th, Friday, March 9th, 2018, was the first of 
what I construed retrospectively as being actual stalking events. So I was, it was after I had had the meeting with um, Yale campus police officer, Grace Schenkel. And I don't know if they had been, if these students, the students um, who were involved in the February 24th incident, I don't know if they'd been made aware of this by the Yale administration. I do absolutely believe that the Yale administration and police were assisting my tormentors. And I do believe that they were complicit in the living or napping while black hate crime hoax. I absolutely do. And I'll tell, I'll go through mm. the details of that. But on that Friday, March 9th, 2018, I was um, on campus walking across a street. Um, I actually believe I had just left the campus post office and, um, there was a group of students that was walking right alongside me. Um, I didn't look at them and they were clearly talking about me. They were clearly talking about the event that had occurred on February 24th. They did not name me at the time. I just felt kind of shocked and I didn't know what was happening. They talked about me being a racist who should be kicked off campus and thrown out of school. This was on Friday, March 9th, 2018, after I had met with the Yale campus police officer and filed my police report. Um, and so I, I just, I was scared. I was shocked. I didn't want to, I didn't want to think at the time that this was a stalking event. I subsequently have come to the, to the determination that it was a stalking event. And I do believe that I was being stalked across campus and there were a couple of and followed and stopped uh, across this uh, sorry just because i've got to ask this now like if you know when when you went and saw the the diversity dean there and she's telling you all oh, people are saying you're racist and all that stuff right like did it affect your classes like did your students say anything to you or i mean like, like was it affecting you at all like did you know I mean, okay, I've, I've been in school, I've been on campuses, and yeah. you know, they're rumor mills, right? So if something like that happens, you hear the rumor a lot. So, like, were your advisors or anyone else coming up to you, like, to show you any kind of support? Or was it just, you're just hearing all this stuff and you're kind of on your own? So, um, I, I, it definitely affected me. And this is one of the things, because um, I don't want to jump ahead, but, like, ultimately... Yale Graduate School Dean Lynn Cooley, with no due process whatsoever, not only banned me from Yale's campus, but she banned me from teaching at Yale. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm going to yeah. try not to cry. That's a tough one for me because um, it affected my teaching. Like, I didn't, I, I tried really hard not to let it affect my teaching but it was obviously a really traumatic time for me and I was extremely upset. And, but I, I just loved teaching so much. It was such a joy for me and I was such a great teacher. And I, I really can say that, like, I just, I always got rave reviews from my students, from my teaching and my students. I was teaching for Yale philosophy professor, Shelley Kagan in spring 2018. And my students just loved me and I just loved them. And I treated everyone, you know, with respect and dignity as I always do in the classroom. And to have been publicly branded a racist who shouldn't even be allowed to teach because I'm such a racist. It just, it really just breaks my, it breaks, I'm sorry. Oh, please, I was just, you know. It breaks my heart. It just breaks my heart. So I was I was struggling that semester. I mean, I ultimately, it, it, I still think I did a, a great job. And Shelly Kagan thinks I did a great job. And my students think I did a great job. But, it, I mean, it did affect me. Like, I, I sort of, um, I just, I had to let Shelly know what was going on because, you know, I just felt like I was sort of struggling to maybe, you know, 
get back to students as, as quickly as I would have liked and, and to finish my grading as quickly as I would have liked just because I was it was really a tough time for me obviously um, I did um, there were a couple of professors that I did immediately tell what was happening um, in particular the director of graduate studies um, Zoltan Zabo I told him uh, pretty much immediately what was going on and and he was someone that provided um, a lot of guidance and counsel during that time and at some point I decided that I also had to tell my dissertation committee because I was really concerned that they were going to hear it through the grapevine um, and m everyone I were most of the people that I work with at Yale are you know, work on social justice issues. You know, my main advisor is is Jason Stanley. My main advisor at Yale is J. It is still Jason Stanley. And um, recently, on if you're familiar with Brian Leiter, he runs the very popular philosophy blog post um, Leiter Reports, and he he has made some wonderful blog posts in support of me. And in, he included, I've released publicly a number of the character letters that my mentors and advisors wrote on my behalf at Yale, um, you know, following this after I was falsely charged with race, racial harassment by Yale Graduate School Dean Lynn Cooley. Um, oh, my goodness. I'm talking so much. Do you need to wrap this up? Should I Should no, I kind of no. get things going? I, You're fine. I'm, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm okay. fine. Um, so anyway, uh, so, so yeah, so I'm, I just bring that up that, um, you know, Jason Stanley is, is sort of known, especially on social media as, you know, a, a social justice warrior type. And so, um, you know, uh, obviously I was, I was really concerned about my, um, about my, um, advisors and mentors particularly those who work in social justice, hearing about this. And I was also, at that time, Tom Tyler, you know, the father of procedural justice, who had worked with Obama on criminal justice, uh, criminal justice system reform with Tracy Mears, both of whom, you know, ran and still run the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School. You know, I was terrified of telling him. I was terrified to have to tell him that I'd been accused of racism. Um... So anyway, so I was telling them, and that's another thing that I think people, um, well, I think you're right. I think that this is true for a, for a lot of campuses, especially smaller campuses, but I think it's especially true for Yale. I don't think people realize when they think Yale, I don't think people realize how re truly insular and sort of intimate uh, the you know the campus environment and campus community is and it is it if it's true for other campuses it's one true 100 fold for Yale that um, rumors and the gossip mill mill at Yale it, it literally spreads like wildfire mm -hmm. and I was we can talk about this too um, but I was already sort of widely known and despised on campus. Um, and this is the reason why I think that the Yale administration were really happy to embrace this obviously false, you know, accusation of racism. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but... Um, I didn't get this letter and actually learn what it was that I had been accused of having done or said that was racist on February 24th until the end of June 2018. But this letter that Sia Bola and Renison had written, and at the time I, I was told it had been sent to Dean Niren, that um, it accuses me of having perpetrated a racist hate crime comparable to a lynching. You, you can imagine the shock that I felt when I read that. I mean, this incident here, I, uh, I don't see any racism in it whatsoever. Like, I, I, you know, um, but to compare it to a lynching? Right, isn't that, in, that's insane. It's insane. Right. 
And the fact that the Yale administrators embraced this obviously false, they knew who I was. Mm -hmm. They knew I was innocent. They knew I worked with the Justice Collaboratory. They knew that the Yale housing managers had exonerated. They knew. They knew I was innocent. And yet they embraced this obviously false hate crime ex accusation. I was being accused of having perpetrated a racist hate crime. It is insane. It's when you step back and actually think for a second about what they did, it is insane. It's completely insane. I mean, this is like this is just like, like I, I, I I have no words. Like I mean, because I, I mean, I, I you, have no you, words. You hear the I mean, you see the overreach and all that. Like you know, all the videos that came out uh, from Evergreen, and they're calling you know Brett Weinstein a racist and all this stuff. And it's like he's not. But to compare, okay, even if you'd been rude to the guy, and even if you had been overtly racist and said said something to him racist. That, to compare that to a lynching, I mean... It's insane. Yeah. Like, you know, there's bad words, and, you know, people... I've experienced it in my life. I just kind of laugh it off because I think it's stupid, but it's... I'm not going to... You know, even if I was upset, like, how, how do you equate that to a lynching? Like, I mean, it demeans... It demeans the people who have been lynched. It demeans... That's right. You know, it, That's exactly right. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. Like, uh, that, that's why, like, this stuff, when I read it and I'm I'm seeing it, you know, uh, like, like, I'm 50, I have friends my age, and I see them post stuff about, you know, how whiteness is, and, and you know, the, these are these are the people who would pay the $2,500 to have Sarah Rao come over to their house and, you know, tell them how awful they are for being white, right? They, 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 and, they, and I see them, I'm like... Don't you guys realize how racist you are? Like, don't you, you know, and everything's, like, everything's ratcheted, ratcheted up to 11. Like, it's, you know, there can't be, okay, maybe the guy was a bit of an ass or whatever, or, you know, unknowingly did something. There's just, it's, it's either you're perfect or you're a Nazi. It's, it's, it's right. insane. It's insane. It's insanity. And this is what I keep saying. I've been, I've been, I have a YouTube channel and I've done, you know, just a bunch of videos mm. about, you know, what happened and what I'm still going through and how I'm trying to save my life and career. And I've been ending my videos by saying that we are living through a moment of mass cultural insanity. We are literally living through a moment of a mass delusion mass insanity and we have we have to stand together and we're going to get through it but i i end my video saying that now yeah um, i mean okay like th this stuff here is um i don't know if you read the book kindly inquisitors uh by jonathan roach uh, no i haven't um, should I? I i keep rec recommending this i mean he was so prescient in it because he wrote about uh he wrote it in 90, i think it came out in 92 or 93 but he wrote about in the late 80s, the Christian right, and then the, the fatwa against uh, uh, Salman Rushdie. And then he was talking about what he mm -hmm. called the humanitarian threat to liberal sciences. So when he says liberal sciences, he means like the Enlightenment and, you know, just classical liberal values. Um, and, you know, the humanitarian threat, he was talking about stuff happening in the 90s on the campuses where uh, speech codes started coming. You know, you can't say this because it's racist. You have to watch, you have to fight racism and all that. And this is what mm -hmm. it is. Like, so the average person, like, oh, don't you want to be anti-racist? You hear anti-racist, it sounds good. You know, who doesn't want to be anti-racist, right? That's uh, right. But but this is what it is. So it, you know, you 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 stir up a mob, and you you know, you, everyone's so focused on being anti-racist that you know something like that happen. You know what happened to you? Or take the Covington kids. You know. That's right. You know, people like reporters calling for these kids to be punched <laughs> and it's like you know slow down a little bit um but yeah I, I, it's, it's mass hysteria and it's 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 like um it's not even mass hysteria it, it's, it's it's like mass virtue signaling or something everyone not, doesn't want to be a racist so they just you know yell it out it's like people need That's to take a step back from all this stuff 
That's right. And you're exactly right. And this is something that people have been commenting on more and more, um, even in recent weeks. And there was that piece in The Spectator by Douglas Murray and John, is it McWhorter? McWhorter? Yeah, John McWhorter, yeah. Yeah, he commented on it and then I retweeted it. And people are talking about it more and more, just saying like, we, there, it is enough of this madness it is enough of this madness and we have to stand up and we have to speak up for our friends like if you know that this is happening to someone and you know that there's someone like me who would never engage in racist behavior in a million years and that you see that this person is just being you know burned in grotesque effigy you know globally vilified you have to speak up. And I know it's frightening and I know it's scary and everyone's terrified that they're going to be next. But here's the thing. If we don't put a stop to it and we don't start speaking up for our friends and for people whom we know to be innocent, you will be next. You will be next. And I keep trying to, you know, yeah. drill this into people's heads. You think you're protected you think this could never happen to you? You think if you don't defend me, if you don't speak up and say what you know to be true about me, that you're you're protecting yourself? You're not. No. I never in a million years could have imagined that something like this could have happened to me. Ne I'm a lifelong human and civil rights activist yeah. who would never be racist ever. And that didn't protect me. Uh, but that's that didn't... Still... It's 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 not. Again, I, some of this stuff. I mean, I don't want to go too far off because I, I, I'd rather have you finish your story. But I don't want to go too far off on this. But like when it comes from like you know when I read critical race theory, so mm -hmm. you know when I'm reading um, what being good, being white by uh, Barbara Applebaum, or I'm reading White Fragility, or you know yeah. uh, like the books, other books on critical race theory. Like uh, I'm trying to write, you know, I've read some. So, like the stuff Crenshaw wrote on it, I've read right. papers, and it's it, it it's not the act in its of itself, right? It's just everything's racist, so every act is racist. It's just the degree of which what how it's racist, and it's I mean it's it, it, like I said, it's it, it's it's a religious zeal in it. it. There there is no compromise. It's you know there is no way to defend yourself. I mean you know denying an accusation of racism in and of itself is racism if you read this stuff. I mean, that's true. That's right. Well, and I say now, I call it a cult. I say it is it is a true woke, I call it woke intersectional feminism. And I actually, I actually like to make a distinction between what I refer to as woke intersectional feminism, which is, uh, and intersectionality. Yeah. But I, I view woke intersectional feminism as this bigoted, weaponized, you know, uh, misappropriation of intersectionality, basically. But I absolutely yeah. agree. And I say that woke intersectional feminism is bigotry and it's stupidity. And the big problem with, well, well one, one of the big problems with it is that one of its foundational premises is that any accusation by a person of color, especially by a black person, of racism against a white person is a condemnation yeah. of racism. I mean, okay, uh, just sticking on this for a second, like Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw's original paper, Mapping the Margins, okay, she right, brought up right. some really good points, very That's good right. paper. That's right. And then you get to the last couple of paragraphs, and then when she ties it to postmodernism, that's where I think the whole thing went off the rails right, right. because right. you know I, I was kind of tongue-in-cheek with it i said she didn't map the margins she gerrymandered them because mm -hmm. it actually is letting people in the margins fall to the wayside like and i one example that i use and i, I actually just spoke with the, one of the survivors of this um the grooming gang scandal in the uk i don't know if you follow that at all uh right. but i mean 11 to 16 year old girls for the most part because they were white nothing was done because their perpetrators were brown that's right i mean i'm sorry but children are the most vulnerable in the society and if that's you're talking right. about a margin or something like that like 
you let those margins down. Um, you know, same thing like uh, Muslim women who want to take off the hijab or ex-Muslim women when they speak that's... out against it. Like, they're a minority within a minority. And that's a margin that gets left out. Like, I, 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 like I said, the, the ideas were good, but when she wedded it to postmodernism and critical theory, that's like, from its inception, it was... It, 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 as soon as you link stuff to that, it's dense to fail, as far as I can tell. Right. And what I always try to point out to people, and I think people are finally realizing this or it, or admitting it, is that if you look at, so this this video that um, Lalata Siambola made of me on May 8th, 2018, if you watch her video, watch her video that she made of me, uh, it could not be more clear that the living or napping while black hate crime hoax was a campaign to publicly shame me for my mental health disabilities. I was targeted because of my mental health disabilities. And I also tell people, uh, like, and this is why woke intersectional feminism is bigotry and stupidity. Why was it okay to target me for my mental health disabilities? Why was it okay for Ciambola to to rattle off, you know, a number of, you know, very derogatory and bigoted terms about me based on my mental health disabilities? And I also talk about, like, I don't think people have any conception of the degree to which class played a role in in this entire nightmare that you know i endured and barely survived um especially in terms of the response of the yale student body and the yale administration but in particular the yale student body against me um so it's like basically i i was this um i was this you know older non-traditional lower socioeconomic class um you know, white woman graduate student uh, with severe mental health disabilities, struggling with severe post-traumatic stress disorder, who was living by herself in an isolated dorm room at the top of a tower on Yale's campus. I mean, like, like, and, and the fact that it was absolutely, like, no bigotry was off the table when it came to attacking me for my membership in those those classes, those groups, it was all okay. It was okay to attack me as this piece of, you know, crazy old poor white trash. That was not a problem. Also, it is insane to me. It is insane to me, in particular in the in the deluge of emails, hate emails and threats of violence and death threats that I received and also in the comments that were made on social media, I always tell people, please realize, please realize that the probably the number one comment made to me by woke intersectional feminists was to tell me that I'm so ugly that I should go hang myself like my dead brother. Oh. That was probably the number one comment made to me in the aftermath of May 8th, 2018. And the fact that these people think they have the moral high ground. Yeah. And they think that's social justice activism. Yeah. And they'll, they'll shout out things like community love and, you know, you know, uh, love, not hate and all this crap. And then they do this. Like, it's just, it's, I don't know. It's okay. When you say cult and all that, it is that. And it's just, yeah. you know, like you walk into a Catholic church or, you know, you walk into a church and the priest says, you know, uh, you know, God be with you, and the people reply back, you know, and with you. It's 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 just that it's it's an automatic response. Like this is right. what it is, and it's just the. Anyways, I I sorry I didn't mean to derail uh, no. your, your, your story there. So yeah, I mean, if you want to get back, continue on back with that, and then if we can. You know. Well, I don't want to. I I'm so sorry. I'm realizing that I think I've had you on the phone for two hours now. Are you good? You're I'm, all right. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, don't worry about it. I like, can like uh, uh, the nutshell version. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's it's fine. I mean, okay. Look, I if I if I need to take a if I need to take a you know, a break for the call of nature, I'll let you know. But I'm okay. 
Okay. And also, it also we could do like a part one and we could come, we could, I mean, there's, there is, that's the other thing. And actually Gretchen Mullen, um, mm. Skeptic Review 89 mm. on Twitter, who's been basically my guardian, mm. my earthly guardian angel through all of this. Um, she always tells me too that like, she just thinks people just have no idea. There's just, I mean, there's, there are just layers and layers and layers to what was done to me by the Yale administration, the Yale police, by, you know, uh, by the moral outrage industry, as I refer to them, the New York Times, you know, et al. Um, and, and so there's, there's so, I mean, there's so much we could talk about. Mm -hmm. There is so much we could talk about. Oh, yeah, I know for sure. Um, but like, if you want to, like, I don't know, maybe if you want to finish, um, just like finish you, what actually happened. happened and then we can touch on a little bit and we can, you know, you, you're more than welcome to come back whenever you want and we can you know, delve into it further. But yeah, if you want to just finish with what had happened and then yeah. talk about that a little bit. So, um, so as I mentioned, um, March 2018, most of that month, um, or the middle two weeks was spring break. Now, during that time, I'm, I'm trying to work with other Yale administrators. I've decided basically that um, I'm not going to be able to resolve this issue with Yale Housing and with Dean Niren. So I move on to trying to work with other um, other members of the Yale administration. I try to work with Yale General Counsel. I reach out to them to no avail. I, I'm working with um, trying to work with members of the Yale Police Force. I ultimately end up going to um, I'm really scared about what's what's happening and what's going to happen. And so I ultimately end up going to the university wide title IX coordinator, Provost Stephanie Spangler. So I start meeting with Provost Spangler. And then at that point, once I get in touch with her and I meet with her and I also meet with associate Provost Cynthia Smith. And at that point, then from the rest of the time in terms of the administration and police, they are the persons with whom I'm having interactions and contact with. Um, so so what I what I usually try to say and ultimately now I realize that they were just trying to pass, um, placate me and pacify me. Um, and it really breaks my heart because I really had hope and trusted. And I know people tell me that it was stupid for me to ever have done this, but I actually really believed and trusted at the time that, um, you know, for at least for a, a couple weeks there that Provost Spangler was actually going to try to help me. Uh, and now I realize that that she was lying to me. She actually said to me at one point, she told me not to worry. She said, don't worry. She said, it's, it's going to be okay. She told me that, and this was still in March. She told me that, uh, that Yale would always do the right thing. And she told me that regardless of PR or legal liability, that Yale would do the right thing. And she told me not to worry. And now I know that she was lying to me, but at the time I really wanted to believe her that she was trying to help me. I'm sorry. <sighs> uh, but anyway, so what ended up happening then through the rest of the semester until May 8th is that um, the the first, what I describe as the first phase of harassment, which is was the resident coordinators using the 12th floor come to basically, you know, torment me, uh, took place until April, approximately April 6th. It picked up right after spring break ended. And around April 6th, I really put my foot down with Provost Spangler and Smith, and I sent them pictures of, you know, the room having been trashed and um, et cetera. And so this is another reason why I think it's it's obviously clear that the Yale administration was working with my tormentors, the students, and also the resident coordinators because every time I would really put my foot down with Provost Spangler and Smith, then their tactics sticks would change. So then from approximately April 6th to approximately April 24th, which I describe as the second phase of the harassment that I endured, what was happening during that time was that 
approximately once per evening, usually quite late in the evening, someone would come by um, my door, my dorm room door, and they would, most of what was happening was they were grabbing the door handle of my door and they were like shaking it really hard, like they were trying to break into my room. And then there was also sometimes some screaming and yelling, sometimes some pounding, and then also sometimes some slamming of doors, the elevator door and the and the 12th floor common room door. Um, and so around approximately April 24th, I, I made Provost Spangler and Smith aware of this, and I really put my foot down about it. And I also contacted uh, Yale campus police officer, Grace Schenkel, uh, via via email, and, and she said that she would um, make a new police report or supplement the existing police report documenting this harassment. Now, during this time, I was not calling the Yale campus police. I was not. Um, the reason why I was not is because I was terrified of further retaliation, but I was contacting the Yale administration and police via email. So now this is the also... I want people to realize this is now the tail end of the semester. And it was either May 8th or May 9th that was the very last day of finals of the spring semester. Um, so anyway, so then the final phase of the harassment after I really put my foot down on April, approximately April 24th, the final phase of the harassment until, until the notorious incident on May 8th was that um, people, and I now believe very strongly that this was most likely Ciambola and Renison, um, approximately, you know, each evening they were using the 12th floor common room. They were going inside the common room. And most of the harassment during that final phase was them screaming and yelling through the adjoining wall into my dorm room from the common room. And then also some slamming, um, there was slamming of doors too, of the common room door and of the elevator door. So that was the last phase of the harassment. Now, during this time, and I actually look to see when I had done this so so I I realized that Yale is going to do absolutely nothing um, and so um, and in fact I even begin to suspect that they're assisting my tormentors and so I'm making arrangements just to get out as quickly as I can I secure um, a storage facility unit and I'm starting to move my things that I can't take with me into there. Now, I would have already left, but I, and I had already made arrangements not to live on Yale's camps, campus the subsequent year. I had broken off my lease agreement with Yale Housing. So anyway, so I'm making arrangements just to leave campus as quickly as possible because the harassment is escalating. I'm realizing that Yale's going to do absolutely nothing to stop it. And I I actually feel like my tormentors and are, are getting, you know, sort of are getting um, perturbed, more and more perturbed as the end of the semester draws closer. And um, so anyway, so... Um, I'm making arrangements to move out. So on the evening of May 7th, I was again harassed um, by persons inside the 12th floor common room. Now, I never confronted them. I never yelled back. I did not have a peephole. I never saw them. Um, and I was being praised by um, Provost Spangler for responding in that way. Um, because, and, and there's a, there's a very specific reason why we can talk about that later or maybe some other time, but anyway, I was being praised by her for, um, responding in that way, but that was also the reason why they, they were telling me they couldn't do anything about the harassment because I didn't know who it was who was harassing me, even though they knew who it was who, like, come on, let's get real, let's be serious. They knew who it was who was harassing me. They knew they knew and they were choosing to do they were choosing not only to do nothing to stop it they were choosing to assist them um so anyway so i'm just trying to get the fuck out of dodge as quickly as possible basically oh i'm sorry i should have asked you no, if it's go, right, go right ahead don't go. <laughs> yes. 
Um, and I'm making arrangements with my surrogate dads um, in Brooklyn to come stay with them. And the only reason why I hadn't just left campus is because I was teaching. So I had to be on campus, you know, to help my students, to meet with my students, to teach. So I'm on the evening of May 7th, I'm frantically cleaning my room. And I'm packing things up and I've been moving things out and I'm trying to get out of there. And I'm also frantically trying to finish grading papers for my students, for my class. And I'm trying to just get out of there as quickly as possible. Now, May 8th was either the last day of finals or it was either or either that or it was May 9th. And so a lot of students were already gone, right? This is the very, very end of the semester. And um, actually, um, I point out, I like to point out to people that later that month when Lolata Siambola appeared on the MSNBC Everyday Racism Town Hall with Joy Reid and Chris Hayes, she lied through her teeth. She lied through her teeth. She couldn't, like it, like, it was impressive how many lies she told, including the lie that she said she tried to make it sound like the semester was still ongoing or something instead of the fact that um, that was the very tail end of the semester, the very tail end of finals. And she said that Renison, Jean-Louis Renison, kept running into me on campus after May 8th, 2018. Yeah, it was crazy how many lies she told. Um, but anyway, so so May 8th, um, uh, I... I'm being harassed, but but it gets quiet. And I don't think that they had ever stayed in the room before. And it's it's getting close to it's around, you know, 2 a.m. or whenever it is on May 8th. And I'm still cleaning and packing up my room. Now, I did not think anyone was in that 12th floor common room. And if I had had any inkling that someone was still in there, I never would have entered the room. So I, um, I actually go into the room, one, the main reason for me going into the room is that I had sort of run out of garbage receptacle space, mm -hmm. and I was just going in there just to throw some trash away. And um, I also thought, well, I'll go in to make sure that the room isn't trashed as well, just as, some, as obviously had happened repeatedly So um, while I'm at it. So I enter the room. And the ex there's sort of two rooms. There's an exterior room and an interior room. And in the, the exterior room is lighted. The interior room is dark. But I can see through the doorway between the two spaces, there's a desk and there's a closed laptop sitting on the desk. And that was, struck me as so odd. First of all, because no one in the in two years that I had lived there had ever used that room to study in, ever. And also, I just thought it was so strange to see a laptop there because I just thought, oh, my goodness, someone left their laptop here. It's going to get stolen. Right. That was the first thing that went through my head because I had actually I, I, I had remembered a situation or something like that had happened um, at San Francisco State University where I got my master's in philosophy you know, until this happened, students would just like in the in the sort of grad student study space, students would just leave their laptops sitting there. And I just thought you are so stupid. Someone's going to walk off with your laptop. And then one day, of course, that happened. And then everyone, you know, stopped doing that. But anyway, so that is the reason that I did not walk into that interior room because I thought someone was in there. I didn't think anyone was in there. I walked into the room because I saw a closed laptop sitting on the desk and that just was such a bizarre thing to see and I was also worried that it could get stolen. So I walk into the darkened room and I see, and it's so clear to me now that this was all staged and that this was, now it's perfectly clear to me that this was sort of a Hail Mary last ditch effort on the part of Ciambola to try to you know, provoke a reaction out of me and to capture me on her iPhone and use it to destroy my life. And I also think in particular from Sean, you know, Sean Kane on Twitter, of course, oh, God, or I'm yeah. sure you know who he is. Oh. Um, he, uh, 
in particular from his tweets because he was sort of the first person who propagated the video that Siambola took of me that early morning um, on Twitter almost almost immediately after the police the Yale campus police officers had left and I think it's perfectly clear from his tweets I think I think it is that they had contacted him prior to May 8th 2018 and they had prepared for him to be you know one of the persons to propagate this video around the world of me so so I walk into this interior room and I see um, just what looks like a human form completely under a blanket from head to toe. I, have, I can't even tell if it's a man or a woman. And I will admit that it was uncharacteristic of me to have done this. And I'm not sure exactly why I did it. I, I think like, I think I was just so... I was so fed up. I think what happened is that because I immediately, I did immediately sort of assume that this was one of the persons who had been harassing me all evening. It's probably one of the persons who's been harassing me for months. And I think I was just like, I was, I think I was, I was just angry. I was fed up. But I, I think I also just thought because I did not at all in any way, shape or form construe what I saw as someone who just like dozed off in the middle of studying or writing papers. That is not what was happening. Like it was very clear to me, like I, I saw this and that this room was being used as like a sleeping accommodation as a hotel room. And I also... Um, assumed that um, I saw this as like, oh, these people who are harassing me are now going to camp out immediately outside of my room. They're not going to camp out. And I also just felt like, like, you know, I just, I think I just too just felt fed up. It, I admit I'm usually like a very timid sort of person who avoids confrontation in the same way that I tried to avoid confrontation on February 24th, 2018 with Renison. And it also, it also sort of surprises me that I did this, but I did um, turn on the light and I said, are you, you know, are you sleeping in here? You can't sleep in here. You can't use this as a hotel room. And, um, and so I did do that. And, you know, yeah, in retrospect, obviously, now that my entire life has been destroyed, uh, do I wish that I had just walked out of the room, even if I had called, still called the Yale camp, the non emergency helpline of the Yale campus police, you know, do I wish now that I had just walked out of the room and not confronted her? Of course, I do. Of course, I do. Um, but, um, Anyway, so she emerged from the blanket. At that point, I could see that it was a black woman, obviously. She was wearing a pink shower cap. But I did not know who she was. I had never met Siambola. I didn't know her name, didn't know who she was. I'd never seen Siambola. And um, I assumed that she was probably one of the people who had been harassing me, but that didn't mean that I knew she was a resident or even a student because people allow like their friends who come to visit, you know, sometimes and they get in trouble for this because they're not supposed to, but they let their friends, you know, sleep in the common room sometime, which they're not supposed to do just like this situation. So anyway, so she immediately, and I was trying to remember, and I feel pretty positive now that she pulled it out from underneath the blanket. She immediately pulls her iPhone out from underneath the blanket and um, holds it up to me. Now I know people will tell me that I'm really stupid and naive for having thought this, and maybe they're right. Maybe it was really stupid and naive on my part, but I, it never occurred to me that evening, not until after I saw the video that had been propagated around the world, uh, you know, to vilify me. It never occurred to me that I was being filmed. It never occurred to me that I was being filmed. And maybe that's stupid and naive, but it just didn't. Because I think I just thought, why Why the fuck would you be filming me? Like, what are you filming me for? Like, it just, 
I just, it didn't never occurred to me that I was being filmed. So she holds up her iPhone to me and I thought, is she taking pictures of me? Is she calling the police? So I talked to her briefly. Um, I asked her to identify herself as either a resident or a student or a Yale affiliate. She, she, it's not that she refuses to do so, but she just didn't do so. And then I identify myself as being a, both a resident and a student. And I, you know, I say to her, you know, you, it, you cannot sleep in this room. You cannot use this room as a hotel room. And then she, in my mind, to me, very clearly identifies herself as indeed being one of the persons who's been harassing me all evening and, and very likely for months. And what she says to me, is she says, um, she asks me, she says, are you the lady that called the cops on that party? And then she says, you are the lady that called the cops on that party. And, um, and I, and I think she's very clearly referring to February 24th, 2018. And I, in my mind, she's, I, I think reasonably, I, I, I strongly suspect that she is someone who's been harassing me that night and um, and for months. So um, anyway, so I actually ask her at that point, I say to her, you know, are you taking pictures of me? And then I say, are you calling the police? Are you calling the Yale campus police? And then I say to her, no, you're not going to call the Yale campus police. I'm going to call the Yale campus police. And then I leave the room and I go back to my dorm room and then I call the non-emergency helpline again of the Yale campus police. Um, and the rest is kind of, you know, history, um, except for the fact that, um, so I, I think people don't realize this too, is that, well, during the time that this is happening, um, so she she records me and then the Yale campus police end up coming. I have to go downstairs to get them. And then they end up coming and we actually just happenstance. We we end up because she had apparently called the elevator to go back up to the 12th floor. We meet her on the fifth floor, which is apparently where her room was. No one lives in the Hall of Graduate Studies anymore. It's been it was renovated and it's been converted into this humanities space. Um, but anyway, so, uh, and then the, there's the female police officer interviews me. I try to explain to her what's happening when, when me and the Yale campus police officer go back up to the 12th floor common room, I immediately see that it's, the room has been entirely rearranged. Lolata Siambola has opened up that laptop and turned it on and placed it on the coffee table in front of the couch. And she's placed books and she's opened up like books and notebooks and placed them on the coffee table. So she's clearly rearranged the space to try to make it look like she was like in the middle of studying or something and she dozed off. And so, and I, and I, um, so I'm with the Yale campus police officer and I'm trying to explain to her what happened, what happened on February 24th, the harassment, what's happening now. And I keep telling her, you know, they did this on purpose to provoke a reaction. They did this on purpose to provoke an incident. And so then at some point she um, decides that she, she's going to leave and go down to the fifth floor and meet the other uh, Yale campus police officers who are speaking with Siambola. And then she tells me to go back to my room. So I go back to my room. When I'm in my room, I'm sending emails to everyone. I'm sending emails to Yale housing to Yale Campus Police Department, to Yale Campus Police Chief Ronell Higgins, to Provost Spangler and Smith, to the entire Yale administration. Like I'm sending emails to everyone and I'm letting them know what happened and I'm letting them know what's still happening. Um, and so then eventually the Yale Campus Police officers, they come back up to the 12th floor and they knock on my door and I go out and I'm speaking with them on the landing. And um, then this is when I realize that um, I start to realize pretty quickly that I'm in some pretty serious trouble. Um, is that, um, you know, the, there's a supervisor in particular 
the supervisor came late to the scene and he just had a very hostile manner to me from the second that he came on the scene. And uh, it, it became very clear to me later when, um, when I was speaking with the Yale campus police officers and then even after that, when he had all of them leave, including the only female Yale campus police officer present. And then as soon as he had them all leave, he began berating me, this supervisor that came late, and he began berating me. Now, during this time, Ciambola had come back up to the 12th floor and she entered the 12th floor common room. And I said to them at that time, I said, oh, is she just getting her things and she's going to go back down to her room? And then they said, no, um, you know, there's nothing we can do about, we can't, you know, stop her from being in that room. And I was like, well, okay, I get it. Um, but, you know, she's, she's, she can't sleep in that room. It's against Yale housing regulations for her to sleep in that room. Um, but, you know, it's like we can't, you know, stop her from entering the room. Um, but I, I start to realize pretty quickly that, um, that I'm being accused of being the harasser in this situation and the perpetrator rather than the victim of harassment. And I'm realizing that pretty quickly. And so, um, and in particular, so I start to try, I try to start to explain to them, no, 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 I'm not the harasser. I'm the one being harassed. I'm the one being harassed. Um, and then the, the supervisor who came late to the scene, he tells me that he's going to um, go to Yale Graduate School Dean Lynn Cooley and basically let um, her know that I'm, you know, racially harassing someone in the dorm. And, um, and I say to this officer, this supervisor, I say, please talk to Yale Graduate School Dean Lynn Cooley because she knows what's going on. She, she knows what's been happening for months. She knows that I'm not the harasser. I'm the one being harassed. I'm the one being harassed. Um, and so then this supervisor says to me, oh, don't you worry. Don't you worry. I know Yale Graduate School Dean Lynn Cooley, too. I know her very well. I've known her for years. Um, and all of this will be on the Yale campus police body camera footage that hopefully I can, the Yale, hopefully very soon the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act Commission hearing officer will make a decision to compel up to compel Yale to release that um, body camera footage to the public or to release it to me so that I can release it to the public. So um, basically uh, at some point, you know, I'm basically pleading with the Yale campus police officers to please listen to me and to please understand that they're under a misconception and that I'm not actually the perpetrator of harassment. I'm the one being harassed. And so this supervisor, he sends all of the other officers away and then he proceeds to just stand there and to berate me. Um, and I've actually documented to the very best of my memory what is what will be on the con what will be the content of the Yale police body camera footage and what happened. And I've done that on my blog and also in on my YouTube channel and in, in videos. So um, anyway, so yeah, he was he was very um, I think I think it had to be against protocol and I thought it was very inappropriate for him to send all the other officers away and then to stand there and to berate me. But he basically tells tells me that in no uncertain terms that I have no right ever to question the presence of anyone in my dorm. Now we just know that that's just that's just stupidity, yeah. right? That's just false. That's just antithetical to everything that the Yale campus police department has ever said and continues to say, you know, they're like, you know, Oh, be cognizant, you know, be aware, you know, there've been a number of instances. There've been a number of instances. Um, and there were, there were two well-documented instant instances in the Yale daily news subsequent to May 8th, 2018, where Yale students found sleeping persons, strangers, including sleeping persons of color, who claim to be Yale students, who claim to be Yale students sleeping in common rooms, you know, in other dormitories. And those Yale students called either campus security or in the one instance explicitly and specifically called the Yale campus police department. 
And there was a there was a photo in the Yale Daily News of all the Yale campus police officers standing around after this student had called because they had come upon, you know, a sleeping stranger that happened to be a person of color, you know, asleep in the common room in um, in their dormitory. And of course, nothing happened to those students. Of course, nothing happened to those students, um, you know. Uh, but so so obviously. Um, um, oh, the one thing I do want to point out to people that surprises people is that so so at some point this supervisor then left and I went back into my dorm room. Now, at this point, I don't I still don't realize that I've been filmed and I still don't realize that my life is about to go up in flames and I'm about to be burned in grotesque effigy around the world. I have no idea. I'm clueless about this. Um, and I still think there's a chance. I think, okay, so these Yale campus police officers are under a misconception. But at this point, when he, the supervisor leaves and I go back into my dorm room, I still think there's a chance to rectify the situation. Because I think like, oh, I mean, yeah, okay, they're confused about what has what is happening. But, or at least they claimed, and now in retrospect, I'm not so sure about this. But at least they claimed to they claim to be in, um, you know, un, you know, they claim to be under this misconception. Now, I'm not so sure that that's the case. I actually think that that supervisor may have come there with an agenda. Uh, I think he may have knew, known exactly what was going on. Um, but anyway, so I I start sending all these emails when I get back into my dorm room and I'm, I'm sending emails to Yale campus police officer, Grace Schenkel. I'm sending emails to Yale campus police chief, Rennell Higgins. And I'm trying to say like, Oh, look, these officers are confused about what is happening here. They seem to think that I was the harasser for some reason. I don't know why very clearly I'm the person who was being harassed. Um, so anyway, so I'm sending all these emails and then during this time, in the early morning hours of May 8th, 2018, Siambola, Lalata Siambola continues to harass me. She's slamming the 12th floor common room door and the elevator door over and over and over again, just slamming them over and over and over again. So I send an email to the Yale Campus Police Department, to Chief Higgins and also this supervisor, and one of the other officers with whom I had spoken that that early morning. And I let them know and I asked them to document it. And they told me that they would supplement the May 8th, 2018 police report with um, to document that um, Siambola continued to harass me that early morning, even after the police officers left. And that is one of the other subsequent FOIA requests that I've made that have not been honored. So I made three additional FOIA requests that Yale asked um, the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act Commission to postpone until the current case is settled. One of was one of which was the video of the March 9th interview with Officer Grace Schenkel. One was whatever this supplement was or this additional police report that was filed by Grace Schenkel on on April 24th, documenting the harassment that I was experiencing. I am. I suspect that that does not actually exist. And the, the third FOIA request I made was for the supplement or additional police report documenting that Siambola continued to harass me on May 8th, even after the police officers left. And I also suspect that that does not actually exist. I suspect that he did not actually do what he said he would do and document that she continued to harass me that early morning after the Yale campus police officers had left. So um, anyway, so so that's what happened. That's what happened. That is the living or napping while black um, hate crime hoax. And so then, of course, um, you know, within within a couple hours, my life had been destroyed. Um, within a couple hours on May 8th, 2018, I was being deluged with hate emails, death threats, threats of violence. I was being vilified on a global scale, especially on social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, Reddit. Um, and then, um, and then the, the press jumped on board. Um, at the instigation of the of Sambola and Renison. And I absolutely believe um, 
I, I do believe, I do believe, I get pushback. I get pushback on, well, I get pushback on a number of things. And that's something, maybe this would be better for a subsequent, a subse- we could do a subsequent sure. um, podcast about this. But I, I, would, I would love to talk about sort of the, the dynamics of, you know, the, of both my supporters and my detractors and the various camps that they come from, because I think it's a fascinating topic. But anyway, I think most people know the rest of the story in as much yeah. that as, um, yeah, basically my, I, was, I was vilified on a global scale, including by uh, the worldwide press. There was hardly a mainstream, you know, um, fake news press outlet that didn't defame me and yeah. um, exploit the destruction of my life for more outrage industry profit. Okay, now, talk about, like, okay, and I mean, in this case, it was fake in the sense that the incident happened, but the description of it was fake, right? Now, right. like, it's, I okay, I joke about the term and stuff, too, but I think, like, a seriously better term for all this is narrative-driven news. Because it's not necessarily fake, right? They, you can watch Fox News, you can watch MSNBC, and watch you know, whatever a speech Trump gives, and they're going to give you that from their narrative. Right. And either side is going to call that fake news, but it's not. It's like it is narrative driven, but the narrative these days is, you know, they want to find the racist, they want the racist to be there, they want the horrible thing to be true. Right. That's right. You know, and That's it's, a- you know, like they can't, it, and again, like I, I, I'm not on campus, so I can't really say, but from everything I'm reading, everything I'm seeing people I'm speaking to, it's not so much the faculty and it's a small percentage of students, but it's the administration. And so, you know, if you think about like news organizations and stuff, the reporter themselves might not be woke, but, you know, the the people making the decisions, the editors or whatever, like, you know, the producers, this and that, push this story, push that, right? Like, mm-hmm. but it's, like, in your case, too, like, no one wanted to look at it. It's like, oh, we found the racist. So here's right. the racist. We don't need to look any further. It's like, the, okay, the Jussie Smollett thing as well, right? You know, right. they were wishing that he actually got strung up. Right, and when it when it came out that it was false, they're still, well, you know, that just goes to prove that you know this happens in this country, so we should treat it seriously. It's like, right. yeah, we should treat it seriously because the guy faked, you know, faked a hate crime. Right, yeah. and it could not have been more preposterous. And I don't know who who special was it? Who uh, which comedian? Um, oh, Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. Yeah. yeah. You watched the Dave Chappelle. <laughs> that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, his bit about Juicy Smollett. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, he's just like everybody was saying, why, why isn't the, why isn't the black community, you know, standing up for Juicy Smollett? And then, <laughs> and then uh, with Dave Chappelle, it's so funny. But he says, um, he says, um, oh, we were. We were we were standing up for him by saying absolutely nothing, <laughs> because his whole story was just so ridiculous. But I kind of like I do kind of feel like, in a in a way in a way, um, that's what happened to me too. Like I get I do get pushback on this, and I think mostly because I think actually the people who were taken in were truly taken in by the hoax. I think, I, I'm not sure what the percentages are. There's some percentage of the people who joined the the defamation campaign against me, who joined the moral outrage mob. There's some percentage of them who were probably legitimately taken in by the hoax. Mm-hmm. I think there's a, a good percentage of them that were just sort of like, um, jumping on the bandwagon to, you know, to make money. Um, and, uh, and, but I do think, I do think that just like the, you know, the Jesse Smollett story was so ridiculous. It was so mm-hmm. preposterous. Like it was just, it was just completely fucking ridiculous that anybody mm-hmm. 
was would have believed that or would have claimed to believe it either way was because it was such a ridiculous story that he told and um and i think the dave chappelle special where he does the bit about it just goes to show that like i think it was i think he's absolutely right it was just completely ridiculous to either have believed it or to have claimed to have believed it either way and i but i actually think the same thing holds in my case i really really do i really do i understand that it was at the apex of the living while black movement Mm -hmm. um and the apex of these viral videos coming out about everyday racism i understand that but i actually think i now think i now think um and i think the evidence bears this out that I would even go so far as to say that not just a majority of the living while black incidents have turned out to be race and hate crime hoaxes. I'm going to say that most of them have. I'm going to say that most of them have. And I think that's true. I absolutely think that's true. And that does not mean I I am someone who has engaged, who has actually engaged in anti-racism activism for years. I am someone who has devoted my life to fighting against oppression, including racism. So I understand that racism exists. I, I understand that. I completely agree with that. Um, I understand that police brutality exists. I understand mm-hmm. that. Um, but, but I, I um, but I also do absolutely believe that I honestly and I've said this multiple times, I think the living while black movement became this, like you said, mass hysteria and it's following it, it came on the heels of the Me Too movement and it's following Trump's election in 2016. And I think there also was um and I think I think a lot of it has now died down. I think, and I don't mean this to pat myself on the back, but because I've been fighting so hard and fighting tooth and nail, um, you know, to get the truth out there, I think in no small part because I've been so public and so vocal that this that, that is a big part of the reason why. But I also think the response of the Covington kids and their legal, the legal measures that they've taken obviously is also a huge reason why Um, that uh, now the, that, that the living while black movement is basically, I think more or less defunct at this point. And I think people are, are realizing now, and I think it's more or less come to a stop. Although recently, you know what, Jesse single, now with the coronavirus, mm. there was someone posted this ridiculous video of this white woman who was covering her face and she was on the subway in New York City and someone and um, a young Asian woman posted the video and was trying to say like, you know, look at this racist, you yeah. know, white woman being racist. And Jesse Single was like, this is ridiculous. This has to come to an end. This posting videos of private people, private figures Mm -hmm. in public and trying to destroy them, destroy their lives because of a 30 second video when you have no idea of the context. You have no idea what happened. You have no idea what happened before or after. You have no idea what's going on. And this like this, this, this this mass marketing the you know this this mass market particularly on social media for these people are just devouring these videos it's it's insane it's insane i don't know if you've seen this um if you haven't i'll send you the link it's really really well done um it's uh someone i know named mike nana um he did, uh, he did some documentary work with James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose and Peter Bogosian, like about their whole grievance studies thing. Um, but he's also, he is a documentary filmmaker. He's the object of the documentary because what he did was, it was about him taking a video of some guy who was drunk and racist on a, I don't know if it was a bus or a, a subway. Oh, Mike, it's Mike Nana? Yeah, Mike Nana. Nana? Yeah. yeah. And, and the movie's called, uh, I think it's called uh, Diligent or Digilant or something like that. I, I but it's about, it's not so much about the incident, it's about the aftermath. Right. And how he regretted that thing going viral 
and this person you know having their life turned upside down for a few days because of okay being an asshole and being a drunken dick on a you know, bus or whatever and like I mean, it's it's really well done and it's you know you see these videos like the first video of the Covington kids that came out when you first look at it it's like okay these guys are a bit of assholes and when you watch the whole hour long thing or the 45th that- okay no they did nothing wrong and it, it, again same thing in your case when I first heard about it and because you only get one side at one point right and right. I'm like okay again I was like okay she was wrong that, that you know like why would you do that especially in the, you know like this day and age but that was like the limit of my thing and then I guess it was I don't know maybe a, it was a while after I saw the original thing where I started seeing you know Gretchen putting some stuff out and um you know I, I think Kathy Young also was talking about it and That's seeing right. that and then it's like okay when the full story comes out it's it's like okay that you know it puts it all into a whole different light and it's okay I'm in that sense I'm glad I didn't jump on it um but even with the Covington kids, I mean, that came out like within within an hour or two, and they're, they were still getting vilified. And you know, e- even to this day, people are like, I have friends who are like, oh, they were racist assholes. I'm like, no, they weren't. You know, maybe they are, but in that instance, they weren't. <laughs> you know, right. um, but yeah. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Like it just, I I don't. I think. I think that. I think there probably have to be changes to our defamation laws. I think and and our and our privacy laws, because um, because this is a very s- specific thing that's ha- being done to people to, and destroying innocent lives mm-hmm. and particularly innocent lives of nobodies, of people who mm-hmm. are entirely private figures. Like I always tell people, like sometimes people now. Um, when they when they continue to defame me they'll they'll say well you're a public figure you're a public figure and i'm like that is the most ridiculous thing mm. you know i'm only a i was the antithesis of a public figure i could not have been more of a private figure um you know the video that was taken of me was taken at 2 a.m me standing in my own isolated dorm room you know, it was such a gross violation of my privacy. And yeah. there's some question about its actual legality. But but regardless of that, like, I could not have been less of a public figure. I could not have been more of a private figure. And, um, and I was basically, you know, dragged into the public spotlight against my will, you know, kicking and screaming, basically. So I just, um, and also in my case, it was a campaign to deliberately and purposely and purposefully publicly shame me for my mental health disabilities. Um, and that's the other thing that makes this so gross. And the fact that like, you know, the ACLU edited the video to obscure that fact. And then they, you know, sprayed it everywhere online on their website. Um, I know it's, it's really upsetting, but there, this is a very specific thing that's happening and it's happening because of the social media world that we live in now. Um, and it's happening because uh, we live in an iPhone world where everybody's got, you know, the latest and greatest camera on their iPhone and they're walking around in public and, you know, and everybody's also, you know, looking to make a quick buck and, and a quick name for themselves. And that was... But it's also, that, la- it's, it's also lazy journalism. Because, I mean, I remember... lazy journalism. Because I remember hearing... A, you know, I would hear stuff like this even before smartphones and stuff when, you know, like camcorders were easily accessible. Oh, you know, you can be your own journalist. Be citizen journalist, blah, 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 blah. And it's, you know, telling people... Okay, you could get lucky and you could, you know, happen to catch something great. But if you aren't trained to be a journalist, if you aren't trained what you're looking for or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, or you, whatever, you might have an hour long video and you edit it down to like one minute that's really horrible or 30 seconds that's really horrible and send that to, you know, uh, send that to a news outlet. You know, let's just say it's a celebrity, right? So whatever celebrity. And, you know, they've been doing great work for an hour, but then, you know, they get frustrated or something and in 30 seconds they snap at someone for something stupid. Like, 
and that's what you show. Oh my God, you know, so and so was so. But I mean, like that's it's, it's what it is, and it's it's lazy journalism. They they don't even want to go check. Right. Yeah. And I, I keep tweeting that and I keep posting that and saying that because it's so it makes me so angry. I mean, I tell people, realize that the New York Times, the New York Times, allegedly our paper of record. Oh, good Lord, no. More than twice. I mean, more than once, at least two times, made super fun and funny front page games out of destroying my life. Out of destroying my life. I, 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 you know, now that I, I was, I was permanently suspended from Twitter, but I, I have been able, obviously, to get my Twitter account back, and I've made some, some I've made some videos, etc., about how to do that if you, because you know, Twitter is on a, is on a rampage, you know, yeah. uh, of, of kicking anybody off the platform who strays even a hair from woke intersectional feminism dogma. So I've made some videos about, you know, what what steps you can take to, to try to get your Twitter account back as I did after being per- wrongfully mm-hmm. permanently suspended. Um, but I so I haven't been taking anyone anymore, you know, because I in an abundance of caution, because I know I have a, a target on my back <laughs> a mile wide. Um, but um but anyway so i've been i used to i used to do this by i used to tag everybody the new york times um i got i got myself in trouble i think by because i was tagging individuals who had defamed me but i think twitter was basically trying to silence me because i have i have very legitimate um defamation claims against not just twitter but against many of their major players including you know, people with blue check marks and millions of followers who defamed me left and right, and some who continue to defame me. Um, and but anyway, so I used to I used to um, tweet this at the New York Times all the time. I still I still stated I just don't I just don't at mm-hmm. them at them anymore. But you know, I just used to say, you know what, you know, you can take your much vaunted journalistic ethics and you can shove it up your asses. Why don't you know? Why don't you try googling someone's fucking name before you destroy their life next time? I'm sorry, yeah. I'm really angry. No, no, no that's, that's it's fine. Yeah, you have every right to be. Uh, no, but okay, like the New York Times, right? You know, all the news that's fit to print. Right. Okay. Now they have some really good people that work for them, and there's some good stuff that comes out of it. Like, uh, uh, there's a. Uh, uh, Rukmuni, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna butcher her name. Rukmuni Kalamuchi. She did a. Mm-hmm. She does some amazing stuff. She like did this great expose on ISIS. Um, like really, really well done stuff. That's but then, good. you know, then they publish an editorial about four black girls being beaten up by two South Asian boys. And, right. And then they say, well, this is due to whiteness. That's it's, right. It's like, pardon. I know. Talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, how, how, you know, or they hire Sarah Jung who tweets about wanting to kill white men as, as your That's editor. Right. Like, I mean, you know, and I got into an argument with a friend of mine about this and I said, okay, Fox news is egregious, you know, like, and you, maybe you can't say the New York times on its own is as bad as Fox news. Cause I think there is more shining lights on the New York times than there are on Fox, especially since, uh, <laughs> Shep Shepard left there. Uh, um, but as an aggregate, if you take MSNBC, you take CNN, you know, take the New York Times, take Washington Post calling Baghdadi an austere Muslim scholar when he got killed, you know, the guy right. who's the head of ISIS, right? Like, as an aggregate, they are just as bad as Fox. Like They are. Th- that's why, I mean, who do you trust now? Yeah. Like, you know, like, like when an article by someone like Rakhmini Kalamuchi comes out, I want to read it. Right, you trust that. Yeah, or but like, if there's other people that I don't know who are good, you know, journalists and whatever, like how much do I want to trust it? Like it's, this is one of the things like you know what's going on now with the with the coronavirus and stuff. People right. don't know who to right. turn to, and and right. they, and they've done it themselves. Like they have shot themselves in the foot, and they have lost the trust of the people. That's right. That's right. And now, now when there's a real, there's a pandemic. Yeah. There's a pandemic and there's a real, you know, emergency, world health emergency happening. People don't know who to trust. They don't know who to trust because all of these mainstream outlets, news media organizations have embraced the fake news 
business model. And I always say, you know what? The next time a journalist a mainstream journalist. I'll qualify that by saying a mainstream journalist. The next time a mainstream journalist, you know, starts whining about journalism dying, I, I'm, I say, just tell them that they brought this on themselves. They oh. brought this on themselves by embracing the fake news business model. Because you know what? I know, I know it, it, we live in a world of, you know, clickbait now. Mm. I get it. I understand there are a lot of ch- challenges facing the journalism industry. But if the New York Times and, and the other, you know, major mainstream news media organizations mm. had said, we are going to uphold journalistic ethics. We are going to uphold our integrity. We are going to we are going to be the one that you can count on that you know that you are not just getting spin when you come to us you know you're not getting fake news you know you're getting the facts you know you're getting the facts when you come to us and if they had taken that stand they would have survived they would have survived Mm -hmm. and i think journalism will die I think journalism and indus- as an industry is on its way out, and I honestly think they have no one to blame but themselves. They have no one to blame but themselves. I think, I think journalism, like as it, it was, stands it now, will die out. But there's always going to be a need for information, right. and I think that you know, people who really want to do the work and want to do it well. You know, the cream will always rise to the top and that's, something will come out and that, you know, it's the, the vacuum will, like, once there's a vacuum created, something's going to fill it and it's... Yes. You know, you know, but yeah, it's, it's... I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. And I think it's just like you said about the particular writer who writes for the New York Times. It's not that you trust the New York Times anymore, mm-hmm. but it's now what it will be is that probably particular people yeah. will establish themselves as people that you can trust to give you the facts. Yeah. Well, like, okay. And, uh, her, I, I've seen a lot of her stuff and I really like it. Like someone like Barry Weiss. I think Barry Weiss is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, you know, and I, I hate saying this thing because I don't even agree with myself all the time. Like I don't, I don't agree with everything she writes, but right. you know, again, like when, when I see her, a piece come out from her and it's all opinion pieces from her, but, I'll give it a listen at least. I'll, I'll read it. I'll take a look at it. Right. And if I, if I don't if I don't agree with it, it's like okay, I'm not. Oh, she's a horrible human being. But it's like okay, whatever. I don't agree with Barry on this one. But it's it's getting there's less and less that you can trust these days. It's like that uh, the I mean I know we're getting way off here, but the the one with Brian Williams and the, the and again the woman from the New York Times when they were making fun of Bloomberg, right. and, and they put up that tweet right that someone put up the tweet. So MSNBC had the graphic and everything ready. Like, like how many people didn't realize the math on that tweet was so wrong? Saying, oh, blah, blah, blah. He spent $500 million. He could have given a million dollars to every American. It's like, no, your math is a little off. And then she got all upset because people were making fun of her. Now, granted, some of the people who were, you know, coming down on her for making that mistake were being horribly racist. Right. But it's like, you know, she put out an article today, like, oh, yeah, th- th- I was being attacked because of racism. It's like, no, you were being attacked because you made a really dumb mistake and assholes were using it to be racist towards you. Right. There's a difference and they there. were not just attacking her. No. I, I think they were attacking Brian Williams yeah. more so. Yeah. But I mean, like the, the whole thing, like that again, like. You know, when you see graphics and stuff like that come up from MSNBC, are you going to, like, no one fact-checked that? Like, no one took a calculator out and did... Oh, wait, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to misspeak. Was Brian Williams the one who pointed out the mistake, or was he the one who made the mistake? Uh, I don't think he, he pointed it out either. Like, okay, the clip I saw, like, the bit I saw, it was him talking to her about it, and <laughs> then they put up the graphic, and she says, oh, blah, 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 he could, and he's like, yeah, yeah, and so he never put any did any pushback at that moment. Not what I saw, anyways. Mm. So, so maybe, he could he could have maybe not wanted to embarrass her. Maybe I don't know, but still, I mean, we come on. Yeah. I, I, but but again, 
it was not like it was not planned or whatever. Like the graphic was ready. Everything was ready. So the graphic was ready. Yeah. The graphic was ready. Exactly. So, so he awesome. must've seen that beforehand, at least like, you know, like just do a little bit of quick math. Like it doesn't, you know, like, you yeah. know, but whatever, sorry. Uh, it's... Someone was telling me, and I think this was following, this was following um, what was more or less an admission, I think by Don Lemon of CNN at the time, was someone was telling me that, um, and he basically admitted like that they're just like someone like Don Lemon and probably someone like Brian Williams too that they're they're just talking heads that they just you know read what's ever in front of them basically and you know that they're not doing or even CNN as a whole even yeah. CNN as a whole that they're just like they're not doing any investigative journalism they're not doing any investigative journalism they're just reading whatever's put in front of them yeah they're there yeah. i mean you know and then whatever uh, like like the news these days i'm it's harder and harder to you know no it's harder and harder to sift through it there's too much of it and right. you know but here's the thing that's really upsetting and i i want people to know that this is that it's one thing to say, and some people like, like I always tell people, look, I have a right to be angry that I almost died. I, I really do. I really have a right to be angry about that. And I also tell people, you know, I really just don't have to be magnanimous. I really just don't have, like, I feel like there's this expectation that I'm just supposed to like turn the other cheek or something. <laughs> like there's this expectation that I'm supposed to just like be like, you know, oh, it's okay, guys. It's okay that you, you know, um, uh, joined a moral outrage mob and vilified me on a global scale and almost drove me to suicide and almost yeah. incited my murder. Like, you know, like, I don't really have to be magnanimous no, to you. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. What's really upsetting, <sighs> what's really upsetting is that, you know, I have sent, I didn't send out very many, and I kind of stopped at some point. Um, and I was having um, an, an attorney, an actual attorney, you know, kind of just give them the thumbs up, giving, you know, s sending their eyeballs over them. But I did send out a few um, cease and desist letters and um, demands for retraction and apology, including to Comcast, um, one per um, MSNBC's defamation of me and one about NBC News's gross defamation of me. And I did send one to CNN as well um, and to the Turner Broadcasting um, Network and um, Corporation and both of them basically I should make these letters public too. I should I should put the PDF I should scan them and put PDFs up online. But both of them basically as well as the ACLU, as well as the ACLU, which is particularly heartbreaking to me, they basically sent back letters to me that said, Fuck you. We really just couldn't care fucking less whether you live or die. And we just yeah. really couldn't care fucking less whether we destroyed an innocent person's life or no, we just really don't yeah. fucking care. You know, and okay. Like let's, once this all, I don't want to say settled because right. it's, but you know, like once everything comes to light, like if you can get that footage and all that stuff from Yale, you know, what are they going to do? Like at that point, you know, like they have no, they have no recourse. And when you mentioned the ACLU, I've, I've lost so much respect for that organization. Me you know, too. In the last in the last two years, the stuff I've seen come out of them, um, they've they've taken on this woke crap like full bore, right. and it's right. um, you know it's heartbreaking. Yeah. They've destroyed their legacy. They've destroyed their legacy. Um, they no longer fight for civil liberties. They fight against civil liberties. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. The, like again for myself i okay i left when i went overseas there's no social media internet you know email and everything was ubiquitous but internet wasn't like what it is now and so i wasn't a vocal person i wasn't anything i come back i see all this stuff going on and i just like i even now like i speak out a little bit i'm doing this little podcast to talk about it 
but it's like you're they're pushing people you know i think a lot of people are you know either one way or another they're they're going fully woke or they're they're trying to be reasonable and you know talk about like enlightenment values or and then you have the other extreme like the candace owens of the world right like right you know which is that's that's another thing on its own but it's the same mentality as the woke nonsense like i think the woke and the red pill are the exact same mentality uh you know i, I don't see much difference between candace owens and cortez <laughs> like i really don't they're they're both insane right. um right. So, yeah, I mean, like, I came back and I'm like, okay, this is, you know, I've always been, like, a, you know, an enlightenment guy. Like, I like enlightenment values. I got a poli-sci mm-hmm. background. That's what I studied. Uh, this stuff hadn't really come into schools yet when I was there. Um, you know, starting at the, like, it was, I was at the tail end of the original p- political correctness garbage. So, I mean, like, you know, for me to come back and see this and see organizations like the ACLU, you know, like, see the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, um, you know, the only one that seems to have not really been taken over by this is, like, the uh, Anti-Defamation League, but who knows? Right, right. Yeah, you're, you are exactly right. You are exactly right. I just, um, yeah, and, and also, this is something, I mean, we could do a whole podcast about this, but... Um, I think it would be fascinating to talk about the response within, like, the secular humanist and atheist and agnostic, free-thinking, skeptical community. Oh, good it, lord! It was insane, yeah, and they, so many of those organizations have been taken over by the woke intersection. Oh yeah, no, it's it, it's it's nuts, and I mean, it's it that that started with. Uh, and again, I wasn't here Elevator for it. Elevator Gate. I wasn't. I wasn't here. But, oh, you no, know but it, it, it started with Atheism Plus, right? Elevator Gate right. was uh, after the Atheism after Plus, that. and the, so Atheism Plus was the precursor of this stuff coming into atheism, right. and then it, that's what broke atheism apart, like as a movement and stuff. Um, look, we are coming up on three hours. So I'm I, so sorry. No, I'm no, so please. Sorry. It's 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 been great. Like it's gone by by so quickly, I, but. I, I, I do need to I, everything like yeah. we covered everything that actually happened, mm. you know, during the living mm. or napping while black hate crime hoax. Mm. That's what we covered. So I think that was perfect. Yeah. Um, if you want to tell people where they can find you and if you send me any yeah. links to any of your stuff uh, and I'll also uh, put in like the articles that uh, Gretchen has written and anything else I can find, <laughs> I'll put them in the notes. So if you send me any links, uh, if you want to let people know where they can find you. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. So I have um, I have a YouTube channel that I'm very active on um, that you can just it's just called Sarah Brosh um, and so you can just search for my name and my videos will pop up and I have um, I also have um, I'm on Twitter I'm back on Twitter <laughs> um, I bet I'm at Sarah Brosh one and my name is uh, my first name is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, and my last name is Brosh, B-R-A-A-S-C-H. And I also have, um, and if you actually, if you go to my Twitter account, which is probably the easiest thing to do, I have my YouTube channel and my blog um, listed there. So that would be great. And I also have my PayPal me and go fund me links in case you want to support my legal fund so that I can sue Yale and the moral outrage industry. That would be awesome as well. <laughs> oh no. Uh, like I said, I'll put all those in there and Okay, uh, that's great. And you know, like I said, if you want to come back and go you know, and we can talk more there's, about this. Oh my goodness. Uh, there's there's so many there's so many different things to talk about. It's it's crazy. I would love to. This was so fun. Thank you yeah. so much oh, for giving oh, me this opportunity. No problem. Thanks for coming on and uh, I you know, it. keep in touch and thank everyone for listening.